Good morning. It is Thursday. It's October 26th. I can't believe it is the end of the month. Lots going on today, but what I am covering today and replay crew, love you. Everything will be timestamped down below. We are covering just some case updates in the Koberger case ahead of a hearing later today and in the Toddy Westbrook case. So for those of you that have been asking for a Toddy Westbrook update, today is the day for an update. That case is scheduled to go to trial in February of next year. For Koberger, there is a hearing later today. I have family stuff later today. Those hearings get dribbled out to the media after they are recorded on delay. So I will not be covering that like whatever live looks like for that. Um, I will try to break it down depending on when those reports go live or try to get a short or a quick bit up for you tomorrow on what happens in that court hearing. We're going to talk about what's going on with that court hearing. And then that should be up on, you know, court TV later today. That hearing starts at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So we're going to jump into that. Lawnards, I see a lot of you sending hugs and love to each other and to Maine. And I wanted to pull up um, this super chat from Brandy Rose, who is a, a longtime member of our community, and just send you and everyone else love in Maine. One of the things that I stick to, even when it's difficult with this content, is making sure that even when things are happening in the world, big and heavy and sad and scary things, that we are clear on what we're covering. So for those of you coming into the chat who need the distraction, we can just talk about other law stuff because the heavy stuff going on in your life is not going to go away. But hopefully for a minute, you can be here and be in community and and chat about it. So for everyone in Maine, we are thinking of you. The law nerds are here. Um, we're going to move the the chat along but just know that you are in a safe space to just chat about other things and know that that's not um our topic for today if down the road a perpetrator is arrested we will look at whether that's a case we want to cover but for everyone um in maine and adjacent be safe it is uh terrifying times and waiting to know if people are safe there is nothing nothing like that so brandy Lots of love and hugs to you. Lots of love and hugs to all of the law nerds who need it and need a safe space to talk about business partner lawsuits. We're going to spend most of today talking about business partner lawsuits. We're going to we're going to talk about things that at the end of the day are really frustrating to the people involved, but at the end of the day it's all it's all just it's all just going to be fine. And a brief Coburger update and if I can actually be an adult and like zoom zoom through things Hopefully, we will get to look at what's going on with this judge in Oklahoma today. That is my hope to be able to just talk about fuckery. Like, can we just run away and talk about judicial ethics and and just be like, what is even happening here? It will, we'll, fingers crossed, because we're going to talk about Tati. And for those of you that have been waiting for case updates, I know, I know. It's one of the cases a lot of you found me on we will get there we will talk about it don't worry it's been the world has been too heavy like it it's been it's difficult to navigate let's get into the um let's get into the intro let's talk about what i do when things are heavy and how i process that i think that might be helpful and then we'll just get into um the rest of it because again I know our audience has a lot that they have survived. We have a very strong and incredible community. And one of the reasons we don't do breaking news is because it doesn't always give us time to process that things are flying at us. And that doesn't always feel safe if you need a space that is not doing that. And I always wanna make sure that we are providing a space where you know what we're talking about. When I say today we are talking about Koberg or Tati and maybe a judge that shouldn't be texting, um, you know that you're not going to get caught off guard by talking about something else. And I take that responsibility very seriously because I don't want to catch you off guard when you've come to a place that you know what's going to be covered and know that that is a, a topic that you have signed in for. Um, 
versus getting caught off guard with a topic that you're like, I was not prepared for that today. Because what I don't want is for those of you that aren't prepared to get sideswiped and end up crying at work. It's happened to me more than once. And it's not always a good feeling, but we have to let the emotions move. So that is one of the reasons I don't cover breaking news because I don't want you to get sideswiped um, by things that are are heavily triggering. Um, it's It's not, I don't think it's fair to you as an audience. It's one of the things we um, talk about together when covering trials. Like you don't know what's gonna come up with trials, but you kind of know the nature of the trial. And so you can know if you're in or if you're out. Um, with the daily topics, it's even easier for me to curate that and let you know what you're in for. It's why I don't cover um, things like the eight passenger case live. I cover those in a podcast where I have time to sit and think about it, where I have time to process it for myself and where you can choose if that's an episode you want to get into or not without worrying that you're going to miss a topic that you really want to hear and have to try to find the timestamps. Sarah D asked, I'm in Oklahoma, what's tea? Um, a judge doing things that a judge shouldn't do. And sometimes it's easier to talk about judicial ethics and be like, it seems like it might be obvious that you can't text talking shit about people, but we'll talk about that. I hope that we get to it. That is my goal. Um, Dr. Barbara Clark in the chat said, after five years of therapy, I'm all about feeling the emotions. And, and I think that's a healthy way to process. I just know that sometimes you need to be in a safe space to process that. Like not all spaces feel okay to be open to feeling the feelings. And sometimes you have to move through and then feel the feelings. So um, because 7K9 said, because 7K9, do we have the text and questions? Oh, we have like the 60 page lambasting. Yep. So we're going to zoom through other things so we can get to that. That's my goal. Like that's my reward for today is to dive into gossiping about judicial disciplinary actions. Emily, what is, what is our world that we're just like, oh my God, can you believe what she said? Yes, that's, yes, yes, that's what we're going to do. Um, Allison, how did someone even find his, her texts? Um, we're going to talk about that when we get to the story. So Emily, can I please have a double scoop of skull ice cream? Yes, we all need double scoops of skull ice cream. I wear this even when it's not spooky season, but I love this shirt. Like we've got the spooky tree. We've got, we've got, we've got spooky season covered. Okay. Let's, um, Jennifer P accurate. Jennifer's like, we're strong, but we're scared. Of course. Uh, the, and those two things for everyone in the chat, I want you to know that those two things aren't mutually exclusive. Being strong in the face of being scared is a level of courage that, um, that is hard to summon sometimes. So being strong in the face of being scared is tremendously courageous. And I appreciate you guys because a lot of you are survivors of a lot of shit that would have broken other people and you're still here. And that's a really cool thing because we found a community that is respectful and appreciates it. And I appreciate you for being here. So quick Coburger updates, Tati Westbrook business partner dispute updates from Vegas and then goss and then hot goss and then the cheese may about judicial ethics. That that's what we're doing. I appreciate all of you for being here on the days that are fun, on the days that are hard. And thank you for letting me talk through the things that we need to sometimes distract ourselves with and understanding that there's a lot of value to that. We get to be here. Sarah said, this is why I love it here. It's not a distraction. It's community. And sometimes you just need to be with your other people. You just need to be with your people. And that is what we have built here on this channel because of all of you. It's what we've built with the app. It's what we continue to build. And I love just being able to say, you know what? We'll just build it ourselves. The community we want to see on the internet, the compassion we want to be able to show each other as humans, we'll just build it ourselves. We'll just do it ourselves. We'll just do it ourselves. 
Celio, there is no better word than she's may. <laughs> it is just, it is, it is the, it is the perfect word. It is just the perfect word. Um, and sometimes we need it. Sometimes we need it. So with all of that, for everyone who's new to this community, welcome. You have found your safe space. We go to talking from everything from Starbucks to band. We're going to talk about Suica in a second, but we need to get to the intro today. And then we do have a sponsored stream, so we're going to get to that in a second, too. Hey there, I'm Emily D. Baker, the Internet's go-to legal analyst, breaking down the legal side of the pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. I'm a big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years, but this is not legal advice. This is where the law nerds unite to talk about facts, not <laughs> Let's get into it. I love this so much, Bedlam Wolf. My family now verifies legal headlines with me because of this group. Yes, this group has learned to ask questions. Rachel said, I'm still processing Britney's book, so I'm a whole complex of emotion and sadness. I have not, um, I have not gotten through Britney's book yet. I am midway through like a 26-hour long audiobook, and then I am going to read Britney's book because I need, I'm going to need to process it, but we are going to talk about that in our member spaces. So don't worry. So chisme is Spanish slang for gossip. I grew up in Southern California. There is definitely an interspersing of Spanish words into my regular vernacular. Just uh, again, the way we all do based on where we grew up, you kind of, you, you, you pull in from, from what's around you. And there's, again, for me, there's no better word for gossip. It's just, it's the chisme. Cause it's like, it's like, it's, it's just, it's spicier than gossip. I don't know. It works for me and I love it. So there, there is that. Um, so I have tapped out on Britney's book. I can't handle the level of fuckery. Fair enough. I'm going to do a breakdown when we get there next week on the podcast. We're going to be catching up on housewives related stuff because next week is Bravo con. Let me tell you a little bit about my Bravo con prep. A, Friday, I have tomorrow. God, it's tomorrow Friday. <gasps> Friday, I have a whole day. A whole day. We have we have hair that is getting that is getting um that is getting zhuzhed, nails that are getting redone. I have been like bleaching my teeth on the regular, like the way I've been prepping for BravoCon. Um I panic purchased new clothes. Does anyone do this when they travel? Like I was going to pack the things that I always pack because I am that person. Like you will watch videos from a year and a half ago and I am wearing this shirt. I do not um, change over my wardrobe frequently. I find something I love. I wear it till it has holes. That is it. But as I was going to pull out the outfits I wanted to take because I try to not just throw everything I own in a bag and like plan like this shirt, these pants. I feel like that's maybe what you're supposed to do when you pack. I don't know. People don't teach us these skills. I watch them. I watch other people pack shit on YouTube to figure it out. So as I'm going to pack, I'm looking at this stuff I want to pack and I'm like, um, so a lot of these clothes, I have pictures of me in at BravoCon last year. So I was panic, panic purchasing clothes, panic, panic purchasing. Uh, yeah, I was absolutely rocking the Crest White trips. I also have like, teeth bleach that goes into my bleaching trays because husband's a dentist. So I will be showing you what I have panic purchased for BravoCon. But the other thing I have been trying to do and getting ready for BravoCon is making sure that I am taking care of myself because I cannot, I have two weeks of travel. I cannot go down. I cannot be sick. I cannot be injured. I need, I need to feel my best. And part of that is eating regularly. It is something that I struggle with when I am busy. The ADHD, like, oh, I forgot to eat. It's five o'clock and now I'll eat everything in my kitchen is real. And that is what I love about today's sponsor because today's sponsor came in and was like, would you? And I was like, yes, please. Because this is how I've been surviving meals during the day. One of the things I really struggle with is finding time to make myself lunch, which will then lead to me grabbing things that are very much not ideal. The solution I have really enjoyed is also today's sponsor, Factor, because sometimes you just don't have time to cook. And even with my Green Chef meals, I still just need something to grab and go. And Factor and Green Chef are part of the same company. So you have a solution no matter what amount of time you have. Factor delivers meals to your door 
ready to heat and eat. With fresh, never frozen meals that are ready in just two minutes, you know that you have a healthy choice to take right out of the fridge and get ready to go. It's time to check out Factor. And because you're a Law Nerd, you can get 50% off your first Factor box with code LAWNERD50. So head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code LAWNERD50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. You have to let me know what you try. All right, let's get back to today's show. And you know what else with Factor is they have meals that you don't even have to heat. So there's literally no excuse for me to be like, I didn't eat lunch today. And now what I need to eat is all of the double stuffed Oreos. So I have been trying my best um, to do it. And I saw Allison King ask in the chat, allergy friendly. I have found it very easy to navigate. I have a tomato allergy. The tomato allergy just wrecks me. And so many pre planned and pre-made meals lean heavily into tomato, um, it's been really easy for me to navigate with them. So you get to pick your meals when you go in and you can list what allergies you have. I have found the same with Green Chef. I've been able to navigate around um, allergies really well. So I know all of you who feel for me, I will accept all of your pity and your sympathy. No salsa, like half the Italian food that I eat is like a no-fly zone. Um, there was one Thanksgiving where I was like, I'm having lasagna anyway. And my family's like, are you okay? I'm like, I'm not okay, but it was worth like for, I'm not going to die. So like, I'll deal with being uncomfortable. The lasagna was worth it. That was about four years ago. I haven't done that at all. Um, so I have found that I definitely need some help around lunch, especially since I start started working at home for myself. I would literally not um, not eat midday at all, and it was becoming a problem for me. It just was not supporting me in the best way that I needed to be supported. But at the DA's office, you were like in trial where you didn't eat, like the food dysregulation. You were in trial where you didn't eat, or at least I didn't eat, because you've got like all of the adrenaline going and all of the things. So when I was in trial, I didn't regularly eat lunch, and I was used to eating breakfast, dinner. When we weren't in trial, we would go out to lunch and it was like a social thing. And it's like, hey, let's go get lunch. So I never really, like as an adult, dealt with actually feeding myself at lunchtime. And like on the weekends, it's not hard because I'm feeding my kids. It's like, I'll just eat what they're eating. So I was struggling with being an adult midday. So this is now part of my routine. And I'm like, okay, I can actually like feed myself regularly so I do not eat all of the things when I'm starving at 6 p.m. So with all of that, we should talk with all of that. We should talk about it. Oh my God, Tian, I'm allergic to garlic. I have friends who are allergic to garlic. It hurts my heart for you. I'm sorry. Um, chilies and poppy seeds. Poppy seeds are a hard one. I love poppy seeds. Um, so I get it. This is such an ADHD rude thing. Like it's so rude. It's so rude to forget to eat and then eat all the things. It's like, are you eating regularly? It's like, um... I don't know. How do you do pizza? I don't do pizza. Um, if I am going to do pizza, it is all white pizza. Um, it has to be, it has to be some version of pizza that does not have a tomato-based sauce. There are lots. Like you can do a a great like pesto on pizza works. Um Mac and Manco's on, it's not called that anymore, on the Jersey Shore um in Ocean City has like a buffalo wing pizza that just has cheese and like ranch and like buffalo chicken with like buffalo sauce or oh my god so good so i generally find those sorts of things but can i can i spill the tea on my children my children don't like pizza so it's not a problem i know uh mac and Mar mac and manco's i think they call it mac and mac now the name changed um i've done alfredo pizza Oh, you know Ocean. I know Ocean City well. My parents met working in Ocean. The, Emily, are you going to tell me your whole life story? Well, a little bit today. My parents met working Ocean City, New Jersey when they were young. Um, so Jersey, going to the Jersey Shore, even though I grew up in Southern California, has been a part of my life since I was a kid. It's where we went to see family and all the rest of it. So I have a lot of affinity 
for the shore, a lot of really good memories attached to the shore. But I was, I felt like the only kid I knew who left the beautiful beaches of Southern California to go to New Jersey in the summer. They're like, you're going where? I'm like, you don't understand. The flies bite, but they're like, what? Yeah, uh, the flies, the flies don't bite you in Southern California. The flies bite. They're like biting flies. I'm like, yeah. And there's these giant horseshoe crabs like run around on the, in the ocean. They're like, what? I'm like, it's wild. East Coast ocean is wild. It's humid. It's all the things. But they make donuts fresh. But there's like food. There's like a boardwalk with food and mini golf and kite flying. And the ocean doesn't try to kill you the same way. Like the, the, the bugs will try to kill you. But the shore break is a much gentler situation. So anyway, it's definitely not as cold. Slushy slush, uh, slushy slush fun in the chat said it's not as cold as the Pacific. True that. And it was nice. Like being able to plop out a chair and like sit in the ocean is a whole different experience from SoCal. You pull that shit on a Southern California beach and you're going to die because the ocean is like shore breaking right there. There's no like gentle lapping um, waves coming in where I grew up in Southern California. So the the shore is a whole different situation. And the thing I loved growing up going to the shore is most of the people that worked down the shore when I was a teen were also teens. So it was like getting to interact with kids from not my part of the country, not my high school. It felt like a moment to like get away from real life and like go engage with other people and be like, you don't know that people have been making fun of me at school since junior high. Hi. I can just be me and you don't know anything about me and it's fine. There's no preconceived notions. It's so great. I enjoyed it. I have lots of, lots of great memories about um, the Jersey shore. We even did like junior lifeguard competitions um, in Jersey. It's just all the, all the good memories. And my Jersey family is fucking hilarious and a lot of fun to spend time with. <laughs> the Jersey wing of my family is a lot of fun. So there's that too, you know, as Italians from Jersey are. So other than the biting bugs, like biting bugs, negative Ghost Rider, but fresh made donuts uh, as you come out of the ocean, plus, 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 A plus, plus. So my kids are like, oh, donuts everywhere else suck. I'm like, yep, yep, they do. Yep, they do. Yep, they do. There is nothing as good as fresh made donuts at the Jersey Shore. Fight me. The bagels in New York City are better, but those apple cider donuts at the shore made fresh? Oh. All right, we're, look, this is the, do you see the problem? Do you see why the factor meals are stacked in my fridge? Emily, what do you want for lunch? Fresh made donuts, honestly. Emily, what should you eat for lunch? Protein and vegetables. But what we're gonna do is talk about Coburger. <laughs> That's what we're going to talk about. Are they yeast donuts? No, they are cake donuts. Yum. And there's a bunch of different ones. Um, oh, the, the green heads, the green heads will run you off the beach. They're so mean. They're so mean. Those green head flies are, are, are just the worst. Just the worst. So, Chad, it's so good to see you. Um, growing up in Australia with all the flies didn't prepare me for the biting flies in France. Biting flies are a whole new thing. I wasn't prepared for, like, sea lice. We traveled to Fiji on our honeymoon, and we're out snorkeling, and I'm like, what the hell is happening? And they're like, oh, there's, like, sea lice. I'm like, there are bugs in the water biting me? What? This is why we need to travel. That's the only way to, like, it, it helps us with a... A, bro a broader world perspective. Um, it, it's it's such a it's such a lovely thing to be able to do. I have um, been really happy living now in the southeast, where so much is driving accessible. God, I love a road trip. So we've been exploring locally. It's so good. All right. Yeah, sea lice. They're the, they bite. You can't see them. It's awful. <laughs> um. Emily, my fiance is clearly influenced by hearing me listening to your food wars that he looked into Flowrider's court battle and gave me a rundown. I, we haven't done that yet. Um, is that, an, sand fleas are bad too? Yes, sand fleas, Sela, it's the worst. All of it's the worst. 
All right, y'all, we're gonna stream for a few hours. We're gonna end the stream with, and all I want are donuts. <laughs> I don't mean to scare you guys off of the, the ocean. It's great. You just need to know what you just need to know what your ocean beholds. <laughs> okay. Are we ready? Let us, let us, let us, let us talk about Koberger real quick. And then we're going to Koberger, Tati, um, hopefully Oklahoma texting judge. Yes, 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 yes. Um, after we answer this very important question from Ashley, Ashley, I need to know if EDB is watching Dancing with the Stars. Yes. Yes. And Special Forces. And I haven't seen the amount of TV that's happening in the Bravo sphere right now is it is is a lot. There was so between Dancing with the Stars, which I consider Bravo sphere adjacent because Bravo Lebs are on it. And there's like, it's like stuff's going on with Mauricio and Kyle and and we're watching Ariana have her like Phoenix rising moment. And then we're watching like her being elegant and strong and gorgeous and talented on Dancing with the Stars. And then we're watching T Tom Sandoval like sitting on the toilet crying with blood coming out of his nose. Like it's such a juxtaposition of what's on the television right now. And then you've got all of the, well, I'm behind on some of the Housewives franchises, but you have so many Housewives franchises going on. We're getting ready for BravoCon. Last year's BravoCon is coming up in plot lines and conversations in the shows that are airing. You just have the beginning of um, Beverly Hills. That's right, Tom was on The Masked Singer. It's like, there's so much television. And I don't have, no, I don't, there's just not enough time. I am behind on all of the franchises right now. I am behind on Orange County. I am behind on New York. I am behind on Salt Lake. And I am trying to catch up before I get on a plane next week. <laughs> wish, wish me, wish me luck with all of that. So that was, that was very, that was very important. Very, very important. All right. Um, let us, oh, and Jax is on, yeah, and all the House of Villains stuff. I haven't even started with House of Villains. Like, I watched everybody go to the House of Villains premiere, and I was like, it's going on the list. Like, it's going on the list. I've seen that Sandoval has a podcast. I have not listened to the podcast. Jordan said it will never stop being funny to me that SLC has a Housewives franchise. It's, it's, inter it's, I'm fascinated by Salt Lake City. Like the Jen Shaw of it all was interesting. Watching the franchise grow after Jen Shaw went to prison is interesting. Watching, the thing I like about Salt Lake, as I cut myself off mid-sentence, the thing I like about Salt Lake is it has what like OG New York and New Jersey had and some of the other franchises as well. Those are the two that came top of mind. But it has the organic long relationship of these individuals like OG New Jersey these were women who knew each other were some of them family with each other they had long standing relationships and that's what you're seeing in Salt Lake City it's people with history it's not just like a group of women that lives kind of all over a general vicinity and are meeting for the first time it has that old school um like I knew you back in high school kind of a a feel and I find that interesting how people navigate so much history together. I don't have the courage to ever do reality TV. I just watch it. Like, it's wild. All right. Chat. Also, did you see that Twitch changed their Twitch streaming rules? The amount of Twitch streamers that are now streaming on YouTube, and I think people can stream and should stream wherever they want to. But what I, I see so much of the streamers that I don't watch a ton of Twitch streams, and they like yell at their chat all the time. I'm like, why are you yelling at your chat? Stop it. What happened with Twitch? Let's let's do a quick bit on this real quick. Let's do just, let's do the briefest of quick bits because this is like inside baseball stuff. The briefest of quick bits and then we're moving on. Quick bits. So Twitch changed its rules. Twitch used to be that you could not co-stream from Twitch. So if you're streaming on Twitch, it can only be on Twitch. So if you want to go make it, if you want to cut it down and put the video on demand, the VOD up on YouTube, you can. But when you're streaming, you cannot stream on Twitch and somewhere else at the same time. 
Then Twitch changed it that if you're streaming on Twitch, you could stream on vertical social platforms like TikTok, but you could not stream on Twitch and on um, and on YouTube at the same time. And at TwitchCon last week, they changed that rule so that if you are a Twitch streamer, you can stream on Twitch and YouTube at the same time. So in the live tab, which is where I spend a lot of time on YouTube personally, you can see that streamers who generally stream traditionally on Twitch and then cut their content down as video on demand on YouTube are now streaming on both Twitch and YouTube. Although you're not allowed to like commingle the chat, I guess, but you're allowed to co-stream on both platforms. So I'm seeing a lot of Twitch streamers that I don't normally see on like stream stream until they clip their stuff down and put it up on YouTube that are now on YouTube. A lot of them just scream at their chat. I don't understand like the antagonistic relationship with chat. I am too old to understand, but they're all just like chat, 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 chat. That is dumb. Chat, chat, chat. And I'm like, I don't want to be yelled at. I don't think y'all want to be yelled at. I, it, like, ah, it's been wild. It's been wild. So um, it it it's just an interesting thing to see. Um. It's just an interesting thing to see. So now Twitch has um Twitch allows their streamers to stream on both Twitch and YouTube. So there's that. It's it's very, very interesting. Um, so you're gonna see more of that here. Not here, not me, on YouTube. Not I'm not gonna yell at chat. We're not <sighs> I just I don't wanna be yelled at. So it it will be interesting to see how streaming and if streaming shifts on this platform. So I just, I don't, I don't know. Chat, I don't know. I don't understand. It's, it's, and again, it's not my content. I understand yelling like together, like what is Ticketmaster doing? Like, like I understand when we're all collectively like, what is happening? But I don't understand the antagonistic between the two, I don't get it. But I'm gonna chalk it up to I'm just old. And um, that's not the experience I want to have on the internet. Like if somebody was yelling at me like that in person, I would I would leave <laughs> Kimura streaming and screaming. <laughs> I don't get it. It's not for me. Uh, it's just it's just not for me. All right, you guys, we need to we need to. Hey, oh, Miguelina pointed something out to me that was in my um in my channel dashboard today. Hold on, let me show you guys real quick. Not my channel dashboard, but let me show you real quick um the the channel today is october 26th look look at this you guys oh wait emily share your screen share your screen share your screen screen and then swoop not that not that where is it this you guys Miguelina pointed out my youtube studio pointed out i joined youtube october 26th 2006 we're in like full go shorty it's your birthday mode so y'all when people are like hey you've been around youtube for a while i have not been creating content this long but i have been on youtube for a while and when i say for a while it has been a while it has been a while. So look at that. Who knew? I don't know what happened on October 26th when I'm like, I need a YouTube channel. But that's what happened. <laughs> so it's our anniversary. Go, go us. Go us. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. So chat, thank you. For those of you that are new, go ahead and subscribe. Who knows? And in my little YouTube note, there's like a little picture of a birthday cake. And it says, hooray, it's your channel's birthday. You've come so far. Just imagine where you and your community will be next year. Keep doing you. Which I'm sure is what they say to everybody. But I'm like, I felt that. Thank you. Like, thank you. Look at us. We're almost at like 145 million views on the channel. It's, bana it's bananas to me. So I'm like, hey. Um, fun fact, high school seniors were born in 2006. It's also the year I graduated high school. I'm officially old. I, I feel that. I feel that because I have a kiddo who's a sophomore and I'm looking at like when, when he was born, I'm like, oh my, 
Oh my. Oh my. All righty. Let us get to Coburger updates real quick. Um, because we need to we need to go to Idaho before we go to Las Vegas. We're gonna be in Las Vegas a little bit longer this time than last time, I think, with that super short arraignment. <laughs> So Brian Koberger is going to be in court this afternoon. I had forgotten the last time I streamed that this is the hearing that was put over from September, August, August maybe, regarding the motion to dismiss the grand jury indictment. I covered all of the motions that weren't sealed regarding the dismissal of the indictment. Some things were sealed, some things were not sealed. and. With that, Brian Koberger's attorneys are arguing a number of things. One, that the grand jury was impaneled improperly, not covering prop or not following proper procedure. Two, that um, there were things presented improperly at the grand jury and then a lot of stuff that was sealed. I don't know if we will see conversation of what's been sealed other than saying, um, and your honor, based on arguments that are sealed or what have you. So we will see possibly them talking around certain things because this hearing is not sealed. There will be recording, but there won't be live broadcasting. It will be broadcast after the fact. Will we see the judge rule on cameras in the courtroom? He hasn't yet, but he's also allowing cameras in the courtroom for this hearing. So cameras have been allowed in the courtroom. It will be recorded. We'll see it later. Do I think the judge will rule on this today? I'd be surprised if he did. He takes a lot of things under submission. I wanted to address what happens if, if the judge dismisses the grand jury indictment, because I think that's the most, um, the, the like most extreme ruling that could happen. Like if the grand jury indictment gets dismissed, then what? So Looking at that, what the defense is asking for at kind of the far end of possibilities, what would happen? Well, the prosecution could do another grand jury. The timing would start over. Uh, the time for the time frame for everything would reset. He's already waived time, but the time frame would reset. But it would just it would just start over. I think that would be tremendously frustrating to the victim's families. I think that could be frustrating to the prosecutors. Um, if there is information that wasn't presented properly, it would give them the opportunity to do a cleaner grand jury if that's the issue. If they weren't impaneled properly, it would fix that issue. But if if the grand jury indictment is dismissed, they'll just start over. So if you were worried about it, um, it's just gonna take it's just gonna take longer. It's un, it's unlikely to me based on everything we've seen, unless there's something in those sealed documents that are just earth shattering. It it seems unlikely to me that that would happen, especially based on an argument that they were impaneled improperly. Oh yeah, and the arguments from the Magna Carta that a grand jury indictment isn't isn't the right standard. I forgot. My brain has wiped itself of that information that they're also arguing that the standard for grand jury indictment, the jury standard is beyond a reasonable doubt and not probable cause. That argument's not going to go anywhere. It's it's going to keep getting made, but it's it's not it's not going to go anywhere. So We'll see. I think the judge will probably take it under submission. I know Chanley Painter uh, from Court TV will be covering that on socials when she has a chance. She's in court and we'll be doing reports from that. So that's what I will be tuning into later from kid events on my phone to see what happens. I, it's unlikely. Maybe the thing I'm optimistic for, here's what I'm optimistic for in this court hearing, is that we get some future dates set so we know what's going to happen. Like, when is the next date? Where are we moving along? When do they want to go to trial? Like, maybe maybe the defense will say, we'll be ready for trial in X number of months, and we'll have some idea of how this case will be moving forward. Right now, my perception of how this case is moving forward is kind of like, yeah, we'll get to it. And I would really love to know kind of what the time frame is, and I imagine the judge will ask them that as well while he has them all on the record and ask them, what is the plan? What is going on here? What are we doing? 
So isn't that what we all want to know? Like, what are we doing here? When is this going to trial? And I think, I think it would be very hard for the victims' families to look at this and not know when it's going to move forward, when they're ready to see what's happening in court. They're ready to see the witnesses testify. They're ready to move forward, I would imagine. And so the litigation delays, again, I would imagine are very frustrating. And I keep saying I would imagine because I have not spoken directly to these victims' families. I have just worked with a lot of victims' families based on the nature of, of my job or my former job and my job now. You know, I talk to you all in the DMs as well. So that's what I'm thinking is, um, for today. That's what's going on on the Koberger court hearing. That's what we are going to see happen. I don't know how long the hearing will be. The judge really likes to ask questions. He likes to engage with the lawyers. I like that of him. He gets, you can see Judge Judge just being like, what about this? And what about that? Like Judge Judge wants to hear your arguments. He wants to ask questions. He wants to engage with counsel and know what they're thinking and how they're thinking. And sometimes when he doesn't agree, he wants to make those points and see if there's a response. He enjoys thinking through the legal issues. I appreciate that with Judge Judge. My feelings will change if Judge Judge yeets cameras from the courtroom. I will be like, Judge Judge, stop. No, you can't. This is this is not going to work. So I'm also optimistic that after all the stern warnings that the media uh, adheres to Judge Judge's uh, rules because I, I really don't want to be on the fuck around, find out continuum with this judge because the find out's what's going to happen. Just the find out is what's going to happen. If you keep zooming in just on Coburg or doing whatever with the camera work, you're going to find out and judge judge will kick out cameras. I don't, I don't, I don't want to find out where we are. I want to just, can we just follow the rules? Everybody. Hey, everybody, let's just, um, film the courtroom. Let's not use a potato for audio and let's all, let's all just work together for that. Let's just, let's just do it together. You guys, let's, just film the courtroom. No potato. That's it. Let's just do that. All right. Are we ready to move on to talk to? <laughs> I saw <laughs> and no keyboard. Don't put the camera or don't put the speaker or the the microphone directly under a clacky keyboard. Like don't do that doesn't help. And I, I, I can we get like a shotgun mic to just directionally point at the people talking that would help that that would help that would help that would help that would help um nj kathy said the college community and the victims extended family should be able to uh file the live hearing or the hearing live follow the hearing live i think is what you mean the college community can't the victims and defendants families can i talked about this a little bit on tuesday the court made sure that there was a Zoom accessible to those that could not be in the courtroom. So there is a Zoom accessible for victims' families, for defendants' families, um, and that information is distributed to them for uh, through the prosecution or defense or whoever, whoever um, is appropriate. So let us move on to Toddy Westbrook updates. Are you guys ready? I think so. I think so. We didn't even do a what are we drinking today? I have I have pumpkin cream cold brew. Today was a Starbucks day. I have water. I have water. I love this one. I have water. I'm waiting for the new holiday cups. Yes, I am. I I, I have there the amount of cups on this desk. Ridiculous. All righty. <laughs> Bia said primed and ready. I love that we're talking about uh a beauty creator and primed and ready was the response. It's flawless. And I appreciate you. Let us, I will do a road so far for all of you that are like, what are we doing? I'll do a road so far. Um, you guys, we had a quick, a quick stop over in Idaho on our way to Las Vegas. So let's head to Vegas. <laughs> It's been so long since we've done a, a circle back into the Toddy Westbrook business partner law suits. They have been kind of consolidated into one lawsuit, but for the brief road so far, back in October, 
2020? Was it 2020? It was 2020. Back in October of 2020. Back in my day. Toddie Westbrook was sued by her business partner in a derivative business lawsuit in Los Angeles. That lawsuit was written by lawyers that were like, you want to know what the T is? Here's the T. And that lawsuit started with, this is a lawsuit because of the defendant's greed. And that lawsuit went on to line out the business partner's allegations that Toddie Westbrook had promised that all Toddie Westbrook business would go on or operate under the Halo Beauty brand. Halo at that time was just a, a vitamin or nutraceuticals company. For all of you that have gone through all of these legal documents with me, uh, nutraceuticals, supplements, it is a supplement company. So Halo Beauty, the business partner says, was always intended to have everything, everything that Toddy Westbrook did in business under that umbrella company. So it would be makeup, it would be skincare, all of it. Tati was getting ready to launch Tati Beauty, which ended up being one makeup palette, and then these lawsuits completely derailed Tati Beauty from continuing on business. Halo Beauty is still in operation. So the business partner is essentially saying, the reason I agreed to having less than 50% of this company is because you agreed to have everything Tati Westbrook creates under this beauty brand. Tati Westbrook and her husband, James Westbrook, are like, that is not what the fuck we said at all. Um, you didn't ever come to the table with the things you said you were bringing to the table, so it was one-third, one-third, one-third um, that the Halo business was being divided up by. After that, things went off the rails. So suit filed in Los Angeles. That suit was filed in October 2020. It was not heard before the court till September 2021 when the court said, um, excuse me, these businesses are in Nevada. The Westbrooks live in like Washington. The business partner lives in Nevada. What does Los Angeles have to do with any of this? And said that this is not the proper jurisdiction for the case. The business partner filed cases up in Washington state. Those also got dismissed. And now all the cases are in Nevada. There was also a, a defamation case to the side of the business partner litigation where Toddy Westbrook sued a YouTube creator for defamation. That case settled. Um, and as part of the settlement agreement, it seemed that the YouTuber was required to turn over any information that they had about the business partner because there are allegations in the Nevada cases that the business partner was giving business information that harmed the business to that YouTuber. So that is all pending in Nevada. And they're in Nevada. Once they got to Nevada, the lawsuits just went like this. And the business partner sued and Tati and James Westbrook sued and the business partner made more allegations, the Westbrooks made more allegations, and they are getting ready to go to trial over all, all of these issues, including did the business partner give information, private business information to third parties to hurt the business, to, to make publicly available? Did the business partner pay for his in-laws health insurance through the business? Was there embezzlement essentially out of the business? Um, is there defamation? Was there improperly recorded phone calls? Did the Westbrooks promise the business partner that he would have only a third of the business because everything Toddy did was supposed to be under this business umbrella? Who is in the right? Who is in the wrong? And during all of that, we have followed along with her lead counsel who's out of California, Michael Saltz et al. Their filings brought us things like monuments to the gods of speculation, and I'm busy, I'm washing my hair, and the rest of it. Clark Swanson has gone through like seven rounds of attorneys. That's an exaggeration, but there's been a lot of them. And is we're going to go to the new one. There's a new, uh, a new motion to remove. So we're going to go to that because the business partner now has another new round of attorneys, which makes litigation difficult and expensive. When you always are waiting for new attorneys to be like, I just got here. What's going on? It's like, 
where do we start? The Nevada cases are like five cases that are all in together. And, and th there's like, f there's so many of them. And there's derivative actions, which are a member of the company trying to use the company to sue other individuals. There's, there's some very nuanced legal arguments here. And then there's so much backstory because the business partner was friends with James Westbrook before all of this went sideways. So it's messy, long business litigation. And we've seen Toddy on YouTube starting to talk a little bit about the fact that depositions were starting, about the fact that this case is getting ready to go to trial. But this has been three years. Um, and it's not going to trial until 2024. This started in 2020. Tati launched Tati Beauty with, I think there was like a blender, um, like a beauty blender. And then there was a makeup palette or vice versa. But the makeup palette had been released as like volume one. So it was my assumption, I don't know if it was everyone else's assumption, that these would be multiple volumes of makeup. And when they launched the first one, I assumed, my assumption, completely my assumption, that they had already kind of planned out volume one is this and we launch it here. Volume two will look like this and we launch it here. Like this is the this is the one year roadmap or or product roadmap for what Toddy Beauty looks like. It launched one and done because of these lawsuits. So Toddy has shut down a business because of this. Um, and the reason I know what Toddy is up to is because she's chatted about it a little bit like a little bit on social media and on her YouTube channel because she's the public person. Um, and Halo Beauty is still operational and she has to continue to be on the internet because I imagine that the reason people go to buy Halo Beauty is because they find it through Toddy Westbrook. I don't think they're just going to GNC and being like, oh, what is this? What's Halo Beauty? Let's do this. They're going to that because of, um, because of, Tati Westbrook, right? So you have to still be on the internet. But the beauty side of the business closed. Tati talked about struggles in her marriage. It's not uncommon when people go through tremendous stress like this that there are struggles. I'm not, I was not surprised to hear that. Sad to hear that, but not surprised. It seems that that is resolved. Um, so it's, it's just continued to unwind for years, um, which is really stressful for everyone involved everyone involved this is stressful and and here's the thing that's frustrating about civil litigation is at the end of the day no matter who wins everyone has lost three four years of their life to this fight and untold hundreds of thousands of dollars and then tati still has to keep going right you have to keep going but recovering from a breach of trust with a business partner is difficult and stressful and sad. Um, and financially recovering is difficult. It's hard. So looking at all of this, they are um, in depositions before they go to trial. When you deal with civil litigation, you do depositions. There are some circumstances in criminal where it happens. It's rarer. But depositions are answering questions under oath. It's being grilled for trial before you go to trial. It's asking questions that not always are in the proper format for trial, but it is information gathering and locking people into their story. So when you go to depositions, and I have done a few, you, depending on what side you're on, if you're the opposite side, you're the lawyer asking the other party questions under oath, there's a court reporter, and everything is taken down. So when you see a trial like, and we don't do a ton of civil trials here, they're normally not televised. But when you see a trial like Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, you see them going, well, at your deposition, you said, and then flipping through all the pages, they're locking people into what happened um, at deposition. So that is the process that's going on now. Depositions are limited in time. And we're going to see motions here about Toddy's team wanting to do more depositions because they ran out of time. And we will go through what that looks like. First, we are going to go to uh, the fact that lawyers in September for the defendant in this case switched over again on Clark Swanson. There already is an attorney lien in this case for other lawyers that are saying when this case resolves, we need to get paid. So let's go and look at why the other attorneys have withdrawn. 
because 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 there's lawyers withdrawing this is this has been a lot of different lawyers for complex business litigation for my opinion it's like my opinion i can't even imagine all the legal fees in four years hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars if not millions um it's a it's a lot i saw this from dusty i hear this in my head too tiger king going i will never financially recover from this it's going to be it's going to be difficult. And with this, um, you, ha you have to find a way to recover, but also trying to, trying to figure out what closing a business looks like and how you recover is a difficult thing to go through. I, I have a lot of empathy for the business partners going through this because at the end of the day, even if you win, you don't win. And for Tati, um, she's a defendant in most of these cases because business partner chose to sue her. And then she and business chose to sue him. So I'm going to, let's just break down how many lawsuits there are. Let's do that. Let's do that. Let's go to this. Let's go to this first document. This is the um, motion to withdraw. We're going to look at the unique thing at the beginning of this lawsuit that you don't see at every lawsuit we do. Okay. Halo Business Partners versus Clark Swanson, Halo Beauty Partners, Swanson Global, Halo Beauty's Partner, LLC. Then we've got Halo Beauty versus Clark Swanson, Halo Beauty, Inc. Then we've got Swanson versus Halo. Then we've got Toddy and James versus Swanson. Then we've got Swanson and his businesses versus Toddy and James. So each of these headings with the line is a distinct and separate lawsuit that has been filed that is now brought together so they can all go to trial at once. Get me a camera and Andy Cohen. One, two, three, four, five consolidated actions businesses suing businesses businesses suing individuals individuals suing individuals all there's a playlist on the channel this one has a very long history of the business partner lawsuits five different actions all right counsel for defendants motion to withdrawal is counsel Having come for hearing on September 7th at 11 a.m. before judge, appearing on behalf of moving party lawyers, not Maximilian, not Maximilian, appearing on behalf of moving party Wiley Peterson, Maximilian, and Michael Saltz, appearing on behalf of Halo Beauties, uh, Toddy and James Westbrook, the court having considered the papers and pleadings and oral argument from counsel and the rules, the order is as filed. It is hereby ordered, Maximilian's on Toddy's team. It's just Wiley. All right, Wiley appearing for moving party, Clark Swanson. It is hereby ordered that the law firm Wiley Peterson and attorneys are relieved from further representation of Clark Swanson and Swanson Global. Um, and then this has a deposition list. So dates to be rescheduled, all the different parties. Did somebody try to depose me in this case? Yes. Did they ever serve me with that? No, no, they did not. They, somebody thought they were scheduling it. Nobody told me. Uh, Toddy Westbrooks, Dr. Shamsa, me, uh, Jason McDonald, Dr. Brown, Doug Banya, uh, Darren Feinstein. So these are all the depositions that are pending in the case. I, I don't want to be on the list. <laughs> no, though nobody served me, so it's not a thing. Um, and other and others that are TBD. Not a core risk. I don't know. I have nothing to do with this. I have not been served. I have nothing to do with this. Why would I be on the list? Oh, well, if you have not watched my video where I talk about Clark Swanson sending me a cease and desist, that's somewhere on the playlist. So I. It seems that party does not appreciate my coverage of this. However, um, you're right, shady millennial. It was not me. It was some other 
Emily Baker. I'm Emily D. Baker. It is clearly not me. Um, okay. It Look, here's the thing. There is nothing, I am not a party to this case. I have no idea the inner workings of Halo Beauty. There is nothing I can answer in regard to this case. So just like when Clark Swanson tried to uh, subpoena me before, he, that subpoena, we fought and he dropped it. So we didn't even get to go to court on it, which I was really interested to do because he wouldn't be able to have gotten the things that he was trying to get, which his lawyers probably told him, which is why he dropped it. But this is this has been a consistent thing where one party in the case has tried to drag me into it. I will not be dragged anywhere. I am too heavy. <laughs> you cannot, you cannot drag me. You cannot drag me. I will not be dragged. So it I mean, it is what it is. It, it is what it is. Um why do I recognize the name Doug Banya? Wasn't he a witness in the Depp trial? I believe it is the same. There's going to be experts on this list with regard to damages and things like this. So anyway, um, yeah, <laughs> honestly, kind of iconic. <laughs> it, look, it just is. But also um, it becomes a whole thing with, with my lawyers because I have those two, being like, um, no, you can't just ask her about her coverage. Like, that's not going to work. <sighs> so it's just, people don't always like the coverage I do. I get it. I, I understand. When, when you talk about people's lawsuits, sometimes they or their fans get salty. Um, Chabibi said, Emily in a toddy, fi toddy filing, we've come full circle. Yep. Yep. Um, the internet is going to internet. Maybe Emily is listed in the lawsuit because there's so much fuckery they need a play-by-play. -play. Yes, it's like, could you just give us a summary? Um, and again, if anything comes of that, I will, I will definitely keep you posted. Can you imagine the clickbait? Can you, I can see the clickbait now. Here's the thing with content creators is content creators are going to content. So are you the timeline expert? No one has paid me. <laughs> no, I wouldn't be the expert. I want to be the commentator. I don't want to be involved at all. Leave me out of it. But it's too funny. Okay. Uh, I am definitely washing my hair. But again, if you don't serve me, I don't know the things that you are trying to do. So the it is further ordered that the court is not inclined to entertain any stipulations or motions to extend discovery deadlines or continue the trial absent a compelling reason to do so. So the court is saying, look, man, um, you can't just continue the case because you got a new lawyer. This is not going to be a delay tactic. Um, that prior to Wiley Peterson and its attorneys discharged. The parties have begun meet and confer efforts to schedule the follow-up date for Mr. Swanson's continued deposition. We're going to get to that next, what the continued deposition means. It is hereby further ordered that Defendant Swanson Global Enterprises is to retain counsel within 14 days' notice. Let me make this a little smaller. It is further ordered that the prior... Uh, prior to the retention of new counsel, the court will make itself available to conduct telephonic conferences regarding discovery matters, the scheduling of depositions, and the current deadlines. It is hereby further ordered that all pleadings and papers will be served on uh, Swanson and Swanson Global for now. So you need to serve the party until new counsel is retained. Um, Jason and Harry, per our discussion, see attached comments via track changes to the draft order. Please let me know. Um, if acceptable and incorporated, you have permission to use my e-signature. Thank you. That is from local council proposed order, granting the firm's motion to withdraw. And then that is the notice of who's getting notice about the motion to withdraw all the lawyers, all the lawyers. So, um, it's just, it's just what it is. Could I be called as a witness? Um, if, if. If someone tried to subpoena me, I would at this point move to quash it because I am not a percipient witness to anything. 
I have not had conversations with any of the parties. I am I am covering the documents. I have I have no percipient knowledge of this case, so I wouldn't be a relevant legally permissible witness because I am not a witness. I have not witnessed things. The, I've told you guys the story of the car accident that my spine surgeon was involved in and I didn't realize that it was the same person until like years later when I'm talking to him after my spinal surgery. I witnessed that with my eyes. That I could be a witness in if that had ever gone to trial or whatever. I I witnessed it. I saw it. I have information percipient to the event. This, the I could, court, f court filings were made, but the court knows that. So, you know, that that is all. But it looks like they will be deposing um, a YouTuber, some experts, and the parties involved. That's not a surprise. But again, people who are involved in the case, who have talked to the parties, had conversations with the parties, worked in the company, or are experts in some ways. I, I mean, legal filings are a matter of judicial notice. <laughs> Did this get filed? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Have you witnessed YouTube fuckery? <laughs> yes. Okay, that's all. Right. Right. Oh, Lord. Lord. Lordy, Lordy. All righty. Let's go to the 63-page motion for deposition. We need to talk about that. So they are ongoing depositions. They will... Um, they will be deposing witnesses and experts to lock things in. So let's do that. This is plaintiff Toddy Westbrook's motion to, um, plaintiff's motion to compel additional deposition testimony of Clark Swanson on order shortening time hearing requ requested. We're not gonna go through all five headers. We're going to get immediately to the, um, Order, so the order shortening time was granted by the court and they granted, you know, oppositions due October 6th. There's already a ruling, which is why we're covering this now. Let's go through the declaration first, shall we? Declaration of Maximilian in support of motion to compel additional deposition time of Clark Swanson and order shortening time. I am a shareholder with law firm and counsel for Halo and the Westbrooks. I make this declaration in support of the motion. I have personal knowledge of the facts contained herein. Um, this request is made in good faith and without dilatory motive. <laughs> dilatory motive might need to be on a shirt. Uh, <laughs> uh, dilatory motive needs to go with the cloak of righteousness. <laughs> it's just, oh, a delight. On August 28th, 2023, defendant Swanson was deposed for seven hours. During the deposition, Swanson gave evasive, non-responsive answers, prolonged the duration of the deposition significantly. These evasive and non-responsive answers are detailed within the motion. Maybe, maybe that's why this is 63 pages long. Once the deposition reached the permitted seven hour mark, I noted for the record that we would be suspending the deposition under rule 30 and seek to continue it. After making these representations, Mr. Wiley, who was counsel for Swanson at the time, agreed to have a meet and confer over allowing more time for deposition. Oh dear. The reasons for continuance include the non-responsive answers received by Swanson, the additional documents that were discussed and revealed to exist by Mr. Swanson that were not produced in discovery. Oh, boy. And the numerous issues and claims that are part of the actions. On September 19th, I held a meet and confer with Daniel McNutt, who is now representing Mr. Swanson. During the meet and confer, I explained that an additional seven hours for the depot was needed due to his non-responsive answers and newly discovered documents and various claims. McNutt offered an additional one hour for the continued deposition of Swanson. Well, those two things aren't the same. You Asking for one hour and asking for seven are quite different. Are quite different. The parties then agreed that they reached an impasse on the amount of time necessary to compare the deposition of Mr. Swanson and that the Halo entities and the Westbrooks would be moving forward with this motion. 
So they've shortened time so that they have time to finish the deposition if it's granted is, is why they're asking for it. Now, points and authorities. Introduction. Swanson was dis- deposed for seven hours on August 28th. Seven more hours are needed for the entities in Westbrooks to adequately depose him. This is a large consolidated action made up of numerous claims. It's five lawsuits in a lawsuit. Mr. Swanson is both a plaintiff and defendant in the action, and his deposition is of prime importance, like Maximus prime importance. This consolidation action is made up of four cases, one action by Halo Beauty, one by Halo Beauty Inc., one by the Westbrooks, one by Swanson directly and derivatively on behalf of Halo and Halo Beauty Inc. In this action, I think it's five. In this action, Halo Beauty has asserted six claims. Halo Beauty Inc. has asserted six claims, and the Westbrooks have asserted two claims, one of which has been dismissed. Comparatively, Swanson has asserted 25 claims for relief, which includes a plethora of meritless allegations. Well, there's the shade. Plethora of meritless allegations, such as an allegation that the Westbrooks killed Mr. Swanson's father-in-law. I had forgotten about that. I had forgotten about that. That was a day when we covered that, and I was like, what? What is happening? The numerous parties in this dispute, as well as the evasive nature of Swanson's 25 claims and Swanson's role as one of the most important witnesses for the case, alone provide good cause to grant more time for his deposition. But there's more. That's a missed opportunity. Where's my, but wait, there's more. One more thing. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. Just Chrissy Jean, are there usually time limits on depositions? Yes. Um, hi, I'm Emily. I'm a lawyer. Um, I can talk a lot. Lawyers can talk a lot. And if you have unlimited time, you might not get to the point and you could end up where lawyers are asking the same question six different ways to try to catch people. Depositions need to be limited in time. They need to be limited in time so that you get to the point. Seven hours is a very reasonable amount of time given the nature of this litigation. Um, so yes, you will see that there is a time limit on deposition. So, but but there's more. During his deposition, Swanson delayed and impeded his fair examination. From the beginning, Swanson could not recall various aspects of the case, feigned unfamiliarity with documents, was combative in his answers to questions, admitted he did little to prepare for the deposition. There were even times when, on the record, Mr. Swanson's own counsel urged him to stop being combative and to answer the questions posed. So this deposition happened before his counsel made a motion and was granted a motion to remove themselves as counsel when your own counsel is like you need to just answer the question like you need to just answer the question and there were other times when swanson would serendipitously remember the answers to certain questions after being unable to recall which would push the questioning backwards mr swanson would reference documents that had not been disclosed would promise to disclose the documents at later times. He forgot the names of key witnesses, which the Halo entities and the Westbrooks had never heard of, but maintained that he had documents in his position or possession that would shed light on conversations with those witnesses. In sum, Mr. Swanson delayed the deposition by being unprepared, reticent, and combative. Both the scope of Swanson's claims and the fact that Swanson impeded the fair examination of him warrant an additional seven hours of deposition. That's a lot to be granted. Tia said, five lawsuits in a trench coat. The imagery of this made me giggle. Thank you, ADHD brain. Are they in a trench coat like this? Like, hey, we're really just one lawsuit. (laughs) Marvelous Marlena said, seven more hours. That's McNutt's. Counsel, I'm sorry that your last name is McNutt. The chat's not going to say anything that hasn't been said before, I'm sure. It just, it just, it just is. Maybe this is why Swanson's new attorney is McNutt. It's because it's salty McNutts. All right. Let us continue. Chat, you're going to kill me. <laughs> oh, chat. You guys are bae, and I adore you. Um, My mind lives in the gutter. It has a penthouse there. 
You're in good com you're in good company, Rosebud. Statement of relevant facts. Oh yes, let's we love facts. Fact it up. This case has a long history. Oh God, that's that's a fact and an understatement. This case has a long history. Mm-hmm. With many claims and disputed factual allegations at bottom, oh dear. At bottom, this dispute is about one man's effort to destroy a partnership with his business partners in the nutraceutical space. Just that's not what he says. He says this is a lawsuit because of the defendant's greed. Maybe that goes both ways. Maybe they could both allege that against the other, right? So, oh my God. Can you imagine like opening statements start and Toddy's attorneys? are like, this is a lawsuit because of the defendant's greed. And it just all comes full circle. If I'm writing the Lifetime movie for that, that is happening. That is how we open the case. We open the Lifetime movie in trial, right? With the lawyer standing up and opening saying, this is a lawsuit because of the defendant's greed. And then you like zoom, zoom, zoom back. You're like, broop, broop back to the beginning of the lawsuit when Swanson originally sues the Westbrooks in Los Angeles. And then it's like Los Angeles 2020. And then it goes to the lawsuit and the T and it like starts there and then backs up even further to like when Swanson and James Westbrook met. And then the meeting that the three of them had about the company and the dreams that they had, and then goes back in time to 2020. I can see it all. <laughs> yes. Q dun dun. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Sounds like a perfect movie opening. <laughs> Baker Media releasing when? I'm ready. It's like, Emily, have you ever wanted to make a movie? No. But I need a movie made of this. <laughs> I need, I need it. I need it to happen. And then clips from Dramageddon. Yes. And then you bring it, and then it just, just, all of it. There's so, there's so much. There's so much. It sounds like an episode of Loki. <laughs> Crap, I'm going to have to watch Wayne's, Wayne's World tonight. Um, are you sure you weren't a director in your past life? No, I was not. There are certain, there are very few things I can see. This I can see clearly just because I have been following this case for three years of my life. Have it be a Hallmark Christmas movie. Right, because then you could dive into the struggle between um, James and Toddy Westbrook and the fact that they like come back together at the end. We have to wait to see how the case plays out, but there could definitely be that arc of the thing about overcoming adversity or whatever. All right. <laughs> Mother Oats. Dramageddon is my Roman empire. It's fair. It's fair. And Toddy saying it's been a long time coming. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right, let us continue on with this. Um, this case has a long history. Facts. Uh, they allege that this is a one man's effort to destroy a partnership with his business partners um, in the nutraceutical space. Swanson, after realizing that he no longer needed the Westbrooks, set out on a campaign to ruin the Halo Enterprises and thereby ruin the West Westbrook's livelihood. As a result of Swanson's action, to sink the Halo entities as well as his failures in the capacity of CFO of Halo Beauty and the Halo entities. Oh, and his failures in the capacity of CFO. The Halo entities sued Swanson. I mean, he did sue them first. Many of the Halo entities claims center on Swanson's intentional actions in breaching his confidentiality agreement with the Halo Enterprises by leaking disparaging sensitive information to YouTuber. See First Amendment complaint. Other claims involve his failure to complete tasks assigned to him instead of opting to send significant portions of his time working, instead opting to spend significant time, portions of his time working with outside ventures, including flavor cure. Oh, we're back to nutraceuticals and flavor cure, y'all. Still other claims involve Swanson's mismanaging of the Halo entity's books and records and misappropriating the Halo entity's money. Swanson, on the other hand, has filed 25 claims for relief, which are a scattershot of allegations. Many of the claims for relief are hard to fully understand, and many more, if not most, are based on false factual allegations. 
These claims include allegations that the Westbrooks unlawfully launched Color Cosmetics outside of Halo Beauty, claims that the Westbrooks did not fulfill their obligation to the Halo entities, claims that the Westbrooks somehow caused Swanson's congenital caused Mr. Swanson's congenital heart defect based on filing a lawsuit and claims that the Westbrooks intentionally and negligently afflicted emotional distress on Mr. Swanson by removing his in-laws from his insurance, which in turn somehow killed his father-in-law. See generally the Swanson first amended complaint. They're like, see all of that. You just gestured to all of me. The Westbrooks need further time to depose Swanson in order to adequately defend against Swanson's scattershot of claims and to prosecute their valid claims against him. Efforts to fairly examine Swanson were impeded by his evasive tactics and answers, as well as improper objections from his counsel. Swanson's delay, along with the extensive nature of or expansive nature of the action, justifies an additional seven hours of depot time. During his depot, Swanson stated that he did not recall when answering questions approximately 160 times. Oh, boy. It's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. <sighs> Who had to count this? Oh, I guess you can do a word search. <laughs> In light of this, Swanson was forced to reread documents that were previously disclosed. And that he had seen before to refresh his recollection, which is wasting time. So when you have not reviewed the things provided in discovery before your deposition to answer questions about them and are like, let me sit and read this, you're, you're, you're ticking down the clock. Well, some of his inability to recall facts that are central to this action is due to his lack of preparation. Some of it is due to his own stonewalling. In fact, during the deposition, Swanson's own counsel stepped in stating, is this all redacted? Redacted. Exhibit one. Oh, Swanson's lawyers filed a motion to seal his deposition. So that is why we're seeing statements directly from the deposition redacted. Boo. Um, all of this inability to recall impeded the deposition and prevented the undersigned counsel from being able to question Swanson on all of the pertinent topics. A few particularly egregious examples or exchanges are set forth below. They include Swanson when he was asked if he performed work in a diligent matter at Flavor Cure. Mr. Swanson became equally combative when questioned on what his experience was in the nutraceuticals space. It's a long exchange. This exchange could have easily been answered at the outset if Swanson had simply said that his experience in the nutraceutical space was limited to the Renuzin, limited to Renuzin and his self-education in studying nutraceutical. What? Did, did that chat, 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 Emily has turned into a streamer. Chat, 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 chat. Uh, it says self-education. I just buffered. I'm sorry. I just buffered. It. They, they brought Swanson on. From the beginning of this lawsuit, they brought Swanson on because of his experience formulating nutraceuticals for Halo Beauty. I am all for self-taught in a lot of fields, but I feel like when we're doing ingestible things, medicine, law that's, you know, you still need to learn under somebody who, who can teach you, I, which is not self-taught. Like I'm all for teaching yourself how to fix your coffee machine on like, YouTube and learning animation and how to make a kick-ass Excel sheet. But when you're making nutraceuticals for a consuming public, <laughs> self-education feels like maybe that's not what you're looking for when he said, I am, I am an expert in doing this thing. 
This exchange could have easily been answered at the outset if Mr. Swanson had simply said that his experience in the nutraceutical space was limited to Renuzen and his self-education in studying nutraceuticals, mostly through his research associated with Renuzen. I don't know what Renuzen is. Instead, Swanson continually implied that he had more experience in the nutraceutical space than he actually did and evaded answering this question by cryptically referring to experience that could be outside of Renuzen. Similar exchanges are littered throughout the transcript. For example, Swanson refused to admit that the company and Gen LLC was related to himself. And once he did admit that it was related to himself, Swanson would not explain how the company was related. And yes, I saw the answer in the chat, which made me think somebody was asking or, or a number of you were asking. The publicly filed one is redacted. The one the court has is not redacted. So the court will see all of the rest of this before they rule. As seen in this expert excerpt, it took a substantial amount of time to get Mr. Swanson to admit that Angen was associated with him at all. And after all the questioning, it is clear as mud how that company is associated with him. He also refused to explain credentials listed on his LinkedIn page. even though he admitted that he maintains the page himself. Um, okay. That's not going to play well in front of a jury because Swanson is going to have to argue the reason that I am worth owning one third of the company is because I bring the experience and this motion, again, this is the Westbrook's motion written in the light most favorable to them, of course. The Westbrook's motion is saying he can't explain the credentials on his LinkedIn page. How is that going to fly to a jury when the Westbrooks are like, what we brought was like this YouTube channel and all of this stuff like pre drama again, like what we brought was this, this many views, this many video views, this is what we brought to the table. And we partnered with you to make you a valuable partner you brought your experience, but if the experience is smoke and mirrors, oh boy. Consistent with the exchanges outlined above, Swanson would also frequently engage in feedback loops where he would answer a question and when asked for more details, he would just repeat the answer. Oh, it was like arguing with your child. It doesn't end well generally when they're stubborn. You're like, can you please eat this? No. Why? No. Okay, but why? No. Well, what else would you like to eat? Nothing. Okay, well, you're hungry. Yes. So what do you want? Food. Well, here's food. No. For example, Swanson stated that Flavicure engaged him for his services based on his experience. Experience. But when asked what that experience was, Swanson, like in the Ren Renuzen exchange above, would just repeat that it was his experience. Okay. Swanson also provided circular, quote unquote, answers about how he allocated his working time between Flavocure and Halo and Block Cap and Halo. Mostly, Swanson testified that he would just allocate time between the two, but would give no further explanation. experience y'all y'all may may you find the audacity of this man it's like can you explain your credentials on linkedin they're my credentials uh, based on what my experience and what experience is that my experience obviously experience the way i stress about things i'm overqualified to do Swanson also engaged in various word games. Ooh, word games. Yes, this is basically the trust me bro of it all. How would you question me? I have experience. Ah! Swanson also engaged in various word games, not like the fun ones you play on your phone, in an attempt to avoid actually answering questions posed. One example was the need to have definitions provided for even the most basic words. 
It depends what the definition of is is. Is that where we are? What do you mean by experience? What do you mean by, is that the definition of is? Oh my God. Have any of you ever had an argument with someone who does this? Who's not a lawyer? <laughs> lawyers also do this. But generally when lawyers do it, they're not trying to stonewall. They're like, well, what do you mean by harassment? They're they're actually trying to understand. But if you've had if you've had arguments with people who are like, well, what do you mean by this? Well, what do you mean by this? I I expect more in the chat are going to say yes, my ex. I see I see so, Stephanie. I see you. I imagine you are not the only one. I imagine you are not the only one. For those of you saying that's like Daryl Brooks, you're not wrong. Okay. Um, we might have to get to code green at some point. Swanson also provided several patently unresponsive narrative answers. And Swanson would choose to answer a question that was never asked, causing counsel to object. Swanson would also forget facts only to remember them hours later after he had already been questioned in those areas. For example, before the lunch break, Swanson asked about a previously filed lawsuit where he claimed he was medically incapacitated due to tinnitus. Swanson answered that he did not recall the lawsuit, but after returning from lunch, when being posed with the same question, Swanson mysteriously, vividly remembered the lawsuit. Swanson would also give answers. I mean, that might be a bit much because there can be situations, I mean, where you are like, I need to be refreshed. And then after lunch, you would generally say, after lunch, I have had time to review this and it has refreshed my recollection, but you generally in a deposition don't like spontaneously have a perfect memory, though I do give some leeway to the, I don't know exactly what you're talking about and then being like, wait, wait. But if there's a pattern of that, I understand that these lawyers are arguing that he's doing it as a delay tactic, not because it's a genuine like, what are we talking about? Then like, oh, wait, you're talking about this. Um, but after returning from lunch, when being posed with the same question, Swanson mysteriously vividly remembered the lawsuit. Swanson would give answers that contradicted each other when confronted on his original answer. For example, when asked if he had a catalog of formulas he was charged with developing for Halo, he initially answered no, only later answered probably, only then to dispute the characterization of the catalog as a catalog, even though that was his original wording, only to say he believed he produced it in Discovery. Huh. No, I don't have a catalog of formulas. Well, I probably have a catalog of formulas. Well, what do you even mean by a catalog of formulas? Like, it's not really a catalog of formulas. Like, what do you even mean by that? Like, I, I pledged that money. That's how that works. Ugh. I use them synonymously. Only to then say he produced it in Discovery. Swanson repeatedly asserted that he produced documents that no one had ever seen, and he also asserted that he had documents in his possession that were relevant to this litigation, but were never disclosed. I mean, I turned it all over. This required the Westbrooks, Westbrooks and Halo to propound further uh, Rule 34 requests for documents that should have been voluntarily disclosed a long time ago under Rule 16.1. When Swanson produces these additional documents, it's almost certain that more time will be needed to examine him about their content. I love that they say when and not if. They're like, when they're produced, if. Finally, Swanson's counsel delayed the deposition by posing invalid objections. For example, through deposition, Swanson's counsel asserted the objection that the document speaks for itself. Wiley also tried to ask questions of the undersigned counsel to clarify the questions for Swanson, which could be construed as improper coaching and took up valuable time. While not malicious, these actions also took up valuable time. Their beef is not with the attorney, but they added in, but also this happened. But you can see by the way they wrote this, their beef is not with this attorney at all. Additional areas to address in the deposition, based on the size of the case and Swanson's delay, counsel was unable to completely question Swanson on all necessary topics and still needs to ask questions, including these areas. Swanson's communications with YouTuber, um, which he illicitly leaked information. Swanson's failure to perform his duties as CFO. Swanson's hiring of his in-laws, including but not limited to facts and circumstances surrounding their hiring and duties. Swanson's IIED claims 
the expert reports surrounding the same and his heart condition, the confidentiality agreement between the Westbrooks, Swanson, and Halo, the damages Swanson allege he incurred, and the experts report regarding the same. Those are big areas of questioning. Damages is a big area of questioning. All of the IIED claims is a big area of questioning. Disclosure of information. These are still large swaths of topic areas. Uh, this is their meet and confer legal standard that you can, the court has the discretion to do this if the court deems it necessary. Uh, argument the court should compel additional deposition testimony of seven, in excess of seven hours. The scope of Swanson's claims and voluminous documents warrant more time. And we have the facts behind why they're saying that. This is a consolidated case with four lawsuits with 25 claims alleged by Swanson. As stated above, Swanson's claims vary from allegations that the Westbrooks violated personal agreements with him and allegations that the Westbrooks violated their duties with Halo um, to allegations that the Westbrooks contributed to the death of Swanson's father-in-law and caused his congenital heart defect. These claims involve events that span over the course of approximately five years. To support the numerous claims, Swanson has produced over eight thousand pages of discovery in the case the amount of documents that swanson needs to be asked about alone justifies additional deposition time in addition swanson referenced more documents through his deposition which have yet to be identified and disclosed the failure of swanson to disclose these documents also justify additional time to depose swanson once the documents are provided swanson impeded and delayed the examination and then they go through when it is the deponent doing it you can get more time uh, lawyer Wiley delayed the depot. Conclusion, the Westbrooks, respect, re, the Westbrooks respectfully request, why is that hard to say? You try it. The Westbrooks respectfully request the court grant their motion for more time. Okay. Filed under seal, Exhibit 1. Exhibit 2 is a request for production of documents. Let's see. We're on page 27 of um 63 so this is all going to be exhibities these are all the requests for production i have not gone through these i want to see what else what other exhibities are attached i imagine exhibit one is the entire transcript fifth set of requests for production of documents uh that's the definition of documents that's the instructions request for documents please provide all give us all the things Documents and communications evidencing a personal check in the amount of approximately $100,000. That is what caught my eye to Harvard Medical School. Paid by Clark Swanson or Swanson Global Enterprises or paid by any third party. I have questions. Documents and communications between Harvard Medical School, because that was part of Clark's uh, purported experience. Uh, let's see. Documents and communications related to Clark Swanson met an individual uh documents and communications between the companies documents all communications between yourself and an attorney related to the company um i wonder if that is not representative because that would be privileged let's see all all the document responses uh all communications between swanson and youtube creator related to specifically seed beauty let's see westbrooks and toddy westbrooks third set of requests for production of documents so these are all the past discovery requests again asking like it is such a push and pull it's like i need this okay what about this okay well i need that what about this um so that is that is these requests over and over and over again for a lot of the same documents and that is the end of that all right uh, jazzy said so wait this has been going on for three years and he still hasn't produced the documents they're referencing not all of them no he he was referencing documents in deposition months before trial that he still hasn't produced if they exist lynn said congratulations on 17 years since you started the channel it's also my 71st birthday and have been a member since just before the depth trial. Hope you have a great day. Lynn, I hope you have a great day too and happy birthday. All right, let's go see what the judge did. Oh no, let's go to the opposition. And then the judge's ruling. It's time for the opposition. 
Let's see what Mr. McNutt has to say. Oh my God, they are McNutt and Wolf. I love it. Defendant's opposition to plaintiff's motion to compel additional deposition testimony of Clark Swanson on order shortening time. <sighs> Hearing date, October 9th. Introduction. The seven hour time limit set on depositions requires lawyers to make difficult choices regarding the priority of topics to be covered with a witness. Y'all should have used your time better. If a party does not ask questions about most material portions of its case during those seven hours, that party assumes the risk that it will never get to ask those questions of a witness in a deposition. In a deposition. That party assumes the risk that it will never get to ask those questions of a witness in a deposition in a deposition setting. A party cannot build a deposition strategy assuming the court will allow more time. Here, based on the plaintiff's deposition of Swanson and their motion, the plaintiffs clearly did not prioritize the material aspects of their case during Mr. Swanson's seven-hour deposition. This reminds, I'm very ADHD, this reminds me of all of the teachers that are like, you should have used the time that you had better. You, sh you should have had the time, you should have allocated your time better. And they're like, but we did, and he was fighting with us. The court should not reward plaintiffs for the meandering way in which they took Mr. Swanson's deposition. This is Swans, shots fired. The motion repeatedly blames Mr. Swanson for plaintiffs' inability to complete their examination in seven hours. New lawyer is like, do better. <laughs> this motion is just like, you, sh you should have done better. Control the witness. When the witness's own lawyer is like, can you please just answer the question? It's not a good thing. No, this is not the judge. This is the opposition. J Anna, just so I'm very clear, this is Swanson's new lawyer's opposition. This is not Swanson's this is not Swanson's lawyer that was at the deposition. This is Swanson's new lawyer that was not at the deposition that would have to sit with Swanson for 7 hours during the next deposition. This is not the court. This is not the judge. This is Swanson's opposition to the motion. Motion, opposition, reply, then generally ruling. So we're at opposition. This motion repeatedly blames Swanson for the plaintiff's inability to complete their examination in seven hours. However, the truth is that the plaintiffs chose to waste time on enormous amount of, to waste an enormous amount of time asking the same question repeatedly and asked an excessive amount of questions about topics that are totally irrelevant to this litigation. She doesn't even go here, Your Honor. The court need only look at the deposition experts provided in the motion to see examples of their poor choices and irrelevant inquiries. Sass. Further, the list of topics that plaintiffs claim they still need to cover includes some of the most critical aspects of plaintiff's case. I don't disagree. The motion begs the question of what the plaintiffs actually spent seven hours asking Mr. Swanson. And this opposition demonstrates they chose to question Swanson on immaterial topics that had nothing to do with the core of the motion or defendant's case. The plaintiffs failed to use their time wisely and have no one to blame but themselves for their failure to ask questions regarding critical aspects of the case. Your Honor, it's not on us. They should do better. Plaintiff's pleadings. Do we need to go through all of this? This might be a helpful world so far. I, I'm not convinced that I'm going to go through all of this, but we're gonna give it a start and see if it helps. Let's see if this is a succinct procedural road so far. Halo Beauty Partners complaint. Plaintiff Halo Beauty Partners LLC filed its first amended complaint in the lead case in this consolidated matter on July 26, 2021. The pleading is replete with dozens of accusations that Swanson performed for poorly as CFO. However, the actual cause of the action alleged in the document substantially narrow its scope. The first cause of action is for breach of contract against the Swanson parties. The crux of the claim is that the Swanson parties breached an alleged oral confidentiality agreement that entirely prohibited Swanson from communicating with media outlets or social media personalities in any capacity about the company, its products, or any of the inner workings of the company or its related entities without the express permission of company. The claims is that Swanson breached this agreement by discussing internal matters with YouTuber. 
Uh, the second cause of action for breach of covenant of good faith and fair dealing against Swanson, this cause of action is partly based on the alleged oral confidentiality agreement and partly on allegations that Swanson misrepresented his abilities and experience and intentionally failed to pay vendors, failed to properly manage collection and payment of sales taxes, and siphoned off company assets. Those are big allegations. Next, they allege that Swanson... Uh, Swanson Company breached the covenant of good faith by breaching the alleged oral confidentiality agreement. They next claim that the Swanson parties intentionally interfered with contractual relationships, alleging that Swanson intentionally failed to pay vendors, caused the business to receive lesser credit terms with one vendor and less than full benefits of these vendors' services. Uh, the Halo Beauty businesses also claim that Swanson, or also claim against Swanson for conversion, alleging that the parties used, that the Swanson parties used Halo funds to pay personal expenses. Finally, Halo demands an accounting from Swanson. The Halo Beauty Inc. complaint, plaintiff Halo Beauty Inc., separate company, filed its first amending complaint on March 1st, 2022, that alleges five causes of action against Swanson for breach of fiduciary duty based on the allegations that Swanson knowingly and intentionally caused Halo to forgo collecting minimum licensing fee payments. Swanson breached his fiduciary duty to Halo by failing to make the required distributions based on its 1% membership interest. Swanson breached his fi uh, fiduciary duty. I said that weird, fiduciary duty, by knowingly and intentionally failing in his duties to protect the intellectual property. They also assert a cause of action for conversion. Conversion means taking someone else's shit and making it yours improperly. Based on their pleadings, one would expect that plaintiffs have been focused on asserting the facts relevant to their claims, but that is not how they chose to conduct their deposition. That choice has consequences, and by subjecting Swanson to more depot time should not be one of them. Swanson's deposition. He's like, we all make choices, friends. You, you made a choice, and now you got to deal with it. The plaintiffs deposed Swanson on August 28th and used their entire seven-hour allotment. Rather than focus on material allegations in their case, plaintiffs wasted enormous amount of time on irrelevant issues. Below is a non-exhaustive list of the sections of Mr. Swanson's deposition that had little or nothing to do with the substance of the case. Plaintiffs spent over five pages of the transcript asking Swanson about Eileen McCombs, who was general counsel for Swanson Global for less than one year in 2022, but the acts which gave rise to this action occurred between 2018 and 2021. Plaintiff spent 20 pages of the transcript asking Mr. Swanson questions about his employment with a company he worked for from 2008 till early 2018 called Black Line Safety. Black Line has nothing to do with this litigation. If they spent 20 pages on it, they think it has something to do with it. Plaintiff spent over 40 pages of the transcript discussing Swanson's work with a company called Flavocure. This company is mentioned in two of the 107 paragraphs of factual allegations and only to claim that Swanson's obligations to work with Flavicure interfered with his duties with Halo. Halo also alleges that Swanson diverted some of the time of Dr. Jose Calderon, a contracted consultant to Halo, to benefit Flavicure. Despite this allegation and over 40 pages of questioning about Flavicure, Dr. Calderon's name did not come up once. Never got to it. Plaintiffs spent almost 30 pages of the transcript asking questions about block cap. Did I read that right? Block cap. Um, another entity Swanson worked for in the beginning of January, 2021. Block cap is not mentioned a single time in the pleadings. In a particularly egregious example, this could have been a footnote, but okay, we're going to read it in footnote voice because it feels footnotey to me. In a particularly egregious example of wasting time on irrelevant topics, plaintiffs spent five pages asking questions about the circumstances of how and when Mr. Swanson met Darren Feinstein, the person who hired Swanson at Block Cap. How Mr. Swanson met Feinstein has nothing to do with this litigation. Could have been a fun note. Plaintiffs spent almost 10 pages of the, tra well, at least we're getting to know what's in the transcript, even though that's redacted. I mean, I'm a I appreciate the summary quite a lot. Plaintiffs spent almost 10 pages of the transcript asking Swanson, excuse me, asking Swanson about a medical malpractice lawsuit he filed in California in 2016 that claimed Swanson was incapacitated from tinnitus. This lawsuit has little or nothing to do with the case. Challenge. He's bringing an IIED claim and asking for damages. 
anything that he had going on, especially medically, could come up as part of that. So I don't think it's irrelevant. Plaintiff spent three pages of the transcript asking about a YouTube video that Mr. Swanson's young daughter made and was sent to Mr. Westbrook, possibly to edit. The questioning has no relevance to this case whatsoever. I mean, unless it was to show that there was, um, that there was not a deterioration in relationship at a specific point in time. Like I can see, I can see that being relevant to you're saying the relationship was bad, but you're still sending these things to Mr. Westbrook. So is the relationship bad? In all, plaintiffs spent approximately 110 pages of transcript, roughly one third of the deposition, asking questions of little to no relevance to their claims in the complaints. Notably, plaintiff did spend approximately 34 pages of the transcript asking Swanson about communications with YouTuber. This is one of the most relevant issues on which plaintiffs examine Swanson, yet despite covering this ground, plaintiffs claim they need even more time for that topic. The parties meet and confer. When Mr. Swanson's deposition ended, there were only five weeks left in the discovery period. Yet, oddly, Your Honor, it's sus. Sus, Your Honor, sus. It's sussy that plaintiffs did not order an expedited transcript. The reason for this has become all too clear. They know all too well. Plaintiffs desire to conduct discovery for at least a month after the discovery period closes on October 9th. Your Honor, the real delay is the plaintiffs. They didn't order an expedited transcript. During the meet and confer on this issue as a means to avoid motion practice, counsel for the Swanson parties offered to make Swanson available for an additional hour of testimony. Your Honor, we tried. We said, you can have him for an hour. And they said, nope. We didn't want to have to do this, Your Honor. We're wasting time writing these motions. The offer was not made with the belief that additional time was required, but only as a compromise solution to avoid motion practice. This is motion practice. Counsel for plaintiffs refused, insisted an additional entire day of seven hours, and did not offer to accept less or attempt to compromise. The plaintiff's attorneys are like, we will not yield. Give us seven hours. Standard of review. The rules expressly limits deposition to one day of seven hours on the record, but it allows parties to request additional time if needed to fairly examine the deponent or if the deponent or another person or any other circumstance impedes or delays the examination. So what the Westbrooks are arguing is Swanson has delayed or impeded the examination, so the court is allowed to grant more time. The seven hours is the maximum amount of time for deposition. Extensions, extensions should be the exception, not the rule. Automatic extensions eviscerate the rule. That's why we're in motion practice, because it's not automatic. They have to argue to the court. The motion should be denied because plaintiff failed to use their time carefully. My ADHD chat is very triggered. I apologize to all of you that are triggered because you've been told your whole life that you did not apportion your time wisely. It is not your fault. <laughs> You're not in litigation practice. It is time blindness. <laughs> Cheryl said the, the Westbrooks are like, we yield not. <laughs> oh, triggered. <laughs> you failed to apportion your time carefully. In this case, plaintiffs claim that they are entitled to more time because there are too many claims to fully cover in one seven-hour session. No, they claimed that Swanson delayed it, and that's why there was not enough time to cover it in one session. That's the You left something out. The reality is that plaintiffs failed to cover the relevant topics because they prioritized irrelevant and harassing topics. And the defense is like, nope, not our fault. You made a strategic choice. Let's see how that plays. <laughs> Interesting strategy, Cotton. Let's see how that works. That's where they're at. The failure to prioritize important topics at a deposition is not a basis for compelling a party to testify beyond seven hours. In fact, the law is just the opposite. A party is under an obligation to be selective in taking a deposition, even in cases that are complex and cover multiple claims. 
This is from the court. The seven error rule necessitates, especially in complex cases, that almost all depositions will be under-inclusive. The examiner, therefore, must be selective and carefully decide how to apportion her time. Oh, uh, my nose. Here, plaintiffs failed to meet this obligation. And as they admit, failed to be selective to, and use their time carefully. As the motion notes, plaintiffs did not ask about the alleged oral confidentiality agreement that makes up a key portion of the case. Seems like a big area to question about. Swanson's alleged failure to perform his duties as CFO. Swanson hiring his in-laws. Swanson's emotional distress. Swanson's damages. Damages are a big part of this. Given the nature of the plaintiff's claims, one would have expected them to prioritize these exact topics, but they chose not to. Your Honor, Your Honor, excuse me, Your Honor. Emily, I did. Excuse me, Your Honor. They fucked around. We would like for them to now find out. Thanks. <laughs> the pleadings purport to detail Swanson's alleged shortcomings as Halo Beauty CFO. Both Companies explicitly include these allegations as the basis of some of their claims, yet the plaintiffs admit they did not explore these issues at his depositions. In addition, HALO bases three of its six claims on the supposed breach of an alleged oral confidentiality agreement, but plaintiffs did not even ask, they did not even ask a single question about this agreement. The same can be said for plaintiffs' failure to ask Swanson about hiring his in-laws or his emotional distress claims. If these are key areas of inquiries, then plaintiffs should have made them a priority. Finally, plaintiffs claim they need more time to ask Swanson about communications with a YouTuber. This claim is indicative of the problem with plaintiffs' arguments. Plaintiffs spent 34 pages of transcript on this topic and still claim they were unable to ask the questions they needed to ask. The seven-hour rule requires plaintiffs to thoroughly allocate, thoughtfully allocate their time. Plaintiffs did not and should not be granted more time because of their inability to apportion their time carefully. Plaintiffs should not be given more time because plaintiffs wasted Mr. Swanson's deposition. The need to avoid wasting time arises because the waste time wasted on irrelevant questions counts against the seven hours allowed by the rules and does not warrant more time. Further, each moment wasted on a useless question is lost and cannot be used to ask a meaningful question. Lost time. Lost time, chat. Lost time, chat. Some of you know the answer to lost time. It's a question. The plaintiffs claim that Mr. Swan, and a story, but we'll do that another day. We've already done it once. Some of you might, some of you might um, remember. So, Amy Liz, I didn't even, no one told, the way I've struggled with time blindness, I'm sorry for the sidebar. The way I have struggled with time blindness, and even my doctors, that I worked with to deal with the ADHD never ever said, oh, it sounds like time blindness is a thing. It was brought to my attention by my ADHD friends, particularly Octa Warren. And then when I started talking to other ADHD friends, like, did you know that this is a thing? They're like, oh my God, that's my thing too. And I was like, why the fuck didn't anybody tell us about this? I'm mad. Time blindness is a huge thing, but it's also why I didn't practice this type of law. I, I, I could not do this, but also when you're practicing this type of law, you generally have other lawyers and this would be a, I need you to help me know how much time this is going to take. Cause I don't know. Judges, Emily, how long will your opening statements take? I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to put my phone on the podium. I'm going to start a timer and I'm going to keep looking at it and I'm going to do my best to stay within the time. I will adapt and talk quickly. And then the court reporter will yell at me and I will try to talk less quickly. But I had no idea. My doctors never talked to me about it. So yes, it is something I talk about a lot because it is so very real and so very under discussed and so deeply connected to ADHD. Look, our brain just works different. Um, so when my husband is like, how long does it take you to get ready in the morning? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I could set timers, but then I would forget how long the timer said that it took me. So 
I don't know. I was, the way we, when Dr. B and I started dating, this is still a sidebar. When Dr. B and I started dating, the way I was late to everything, he's like, okay, you know what time we need to leave. You know what needs to be done before you leave. How, how do you not connect those dots to leave the house when you need to leave? And I'm like, so I hear what you're saying, but I don't know how that works. So now it is, it goes like this, Dr. B, what time do we need to leave for X? What time do we need to get in the car? How long is it going to take to drive from here to there? How long is it going to take once we get there? Because this is the other thing I'll do. Like, oh, we have a band competition. Band, band performs at this time. My brain, despite being 45 years old, will be like, oh, this is the time you need to be there. It's not, though, because I need time to park my car, walk through where I'm going, show people my tickets, find a seat. Like, I can't just show up at the time the thing starts because there's like all this other shit that has to happen before I can just sit down and watch the thing. So I will now ask to have him help me backwards set when I need to do things and then be like, okay, so we need to be at the place 15, 20 minutes, whatever, before the thing starts. And then we need to drive. So what time do we need to leave in the car? Okay, so we need to leave in the car at this time. So then I will set a timer for 15 minutes before that and be like, okay, 15 minutes before that is when I need to like feel like I need to leave so that I have buffer because <laughs> I need buffer because I there will always be something I forget. So then I need to work backwards from there and be like, okay, but this is a conversation that happens with every single thing that I do. And there are times that ADHD is exhausting and I am still awfully late. So I ask for help, help, help. And with judges, it was generally a, Miss Baker, how long was this take? I don't know, Your Honor, how long do I have? We'll just, time is a construct, we'll, we'll fill it. It's like the TARDIS, <laughs> it's just bigger on the inside. We'll just make it work with whatever we've got. It'll be, I'll be fine. But it is so hard, so I get it. But this is how, when you have ADHD, it can take an entire day if you have an appointment in the afternoon. This is why I set my appointments in the morning. If I have a 2 p.m. appointment, my entire day is fucked. I realize that other people, an appointment in the afternoon does not screw up their entire day. But for me, it's it screws up my entire day. All of it. So I ask my team for help. I'm like, okay, I need you to set the other steps on the calendar. Not just like, Emily, you have an interview at this time. But I need you to let me know if I need to have like makeup on. And then I need you to block out the time ahead of that so I can get ready. And I need you to also set an, a, a timer in my calendar for 15 minutes before I need to be on the thing. Because if in my brain, I'm like, oh, I need to be on a call at 1.30. I'm sitting down in my chair at 1.30, but I still need to put in my in-ears. I still need to turn on my microphone. <sighs> so I'm sorry to tangent about time blindness. It is hard. So this is why I'm just like, it would be hard to apportion seven hours, but there are other people who are very good at this skill. I would partner with them. Help? How do you do this? I don't know. I set a lot of timers. Sometimes um, I accidentally ignore them. Like, like secondhand ignore them. Like I, I don't even process that I've ignored them. Like it doesn't even register with me. I'm just like, because they go off so much. I have timers for everything. And then I ignore them. <laughs> Executive function is like the core of my ADHD, the, the core. So hopefully for all of you who are just like, oh my God, it's me. The executive dysfunction is real. But let me tell you how productive I am when I am hyper-focused. It's, it's unlike anything else. It's just, it is being in the zone and it is a delight. So the hyper-focus is real, but so is the time blindness which is how I ended up spending like four days solid playing civilizations on my computer when I was in college, um, barely eating because I was hyper-focused. It's the same with the freaking Suica game. Did you know? And then we're going back to this, I swear. Did you know that the Suica game has now been released in the US eShop for Nintendo? The hurdles I jumped through at like midnight to try to figure out how to create 
a Japanese eShop account for my Nintendo Switch so I could play the motherfucking fruit game. It's now in the US eShop. Nintendo has been like, oh, why does everyone want this? Streamers, everyone wants this game because of streamers. It's so fun. It's like $3. It's like $3 in um, the Nintendo eShop. It has a Halloween version. It is so much fun. So if you have a Nintendo Switch and you love a silly little game, the Suica game, and the Halloween version is a delight. And even if you have already downloaded the Japanese version, you can switch your controls around so that it shows in English on the screen. I didn't know that it did that. And then next time we'll all talk about our scores. I just downloaded it today. It's so much fun. Um, boss, I have an appointment at four o'clock. Need a day off. Yes. Yes. Because that's the only way you're going to get there. Um, let's see. Uh, don't do timer reminders on Alexa. <laughs> it will read what, yes, it will. It will know all the things. Um, I don't, I do them on my phone, but still. All right. Oh my God. I totally just ignored one of my alarms listening to you talk about ignoring alarms. <laughs> Debra, go do the thing that you need to do. I'll be here when you get back. Don't worry. Okay. Let us, let us continue. Let I love that you guys are pl currently playing Sweet. I swear I'm going to, I'm going to figure out. I have no idea if it's only for Switch. I, I honestly have no idea. That's where I play all my Nintendo games. I am going to find a way to stream my Switch and do a Suica stream with y'all. And we're going to just hang out and game together. I will find a way. I just don't know when. Emily, what are you going to do on the plane when you have to travel for BravoCon? Listen to Britney's book and play the Suica game. And no one's going to talk to me. The flight attendant's going to be like, would you like a glass of champagne? Yes, I'm heading to Vegas. I need champs, I need my Switch, and I need Britney's book. That is all I am going to do. That is all I am going for hours. Also, I need to put this in my Amazon shop. If you have a Switch, this little Switch holder is the greatest thing on earth. I need to put it in my Amazon shop. It makes it easier to hold the Switch because it gives you a little bit more grip. I love it so much. Okay, we're going back. We're going back. We're going back to, we're going, going back, back to court. Let's go back to court. I'm sorry for the time blind tangent. I play, I play a lot of Animal Crossing on flights. I was on a flight once where I was playing, where I was like circling around to shoot things in uh, Zelda. And I don't play as much Zelda on flights anymore because I realized I got too into it. And that's like me and other people's spaces. All right, back to lawsuit, back to lawsuit. Okay, the plaintiffs wasted an inordinate amount of time on other topics, the chat, we all feel attacked, but I, lawyers, I get it. Over five pages of the transcript asking about whoever Eileen McCombs is, lawyer, uh, approximately 20 pages asking Swan Swanson questions about his employment with the company he worked for 2008 to 2018, probably going to experience, 40 pages discussing Swanson's work with Flavacure, 30 pages asking questions about block cap. This is irrelevant questioning, takes up 100 page of a 342 page transcript, meaning plaintiffs wasted one third of the time on irrelevant topics. It's hard for defense to say they're irrelevant because for the plaintiffs, they might not be irrelevant. The defense might just not see their strategy, but I get it. Aaron says there is a Suica browser game just search Suica game. There is. It's probably not as cute, but I'm sure there is. Like, combining fruit can be found. What? That sounds amazing. That sounds amazing. I need, need, need. And they're going to have to go back here. We're going to, we're going to need to put them back here. Okay. Plaintiffs should not be given more time to depose Swanson because Mr. Swanson did not impede his deposition admits plaintiff's inability to prioritize topics and asking meandering questions on irrelevant issues. Zing. Plaintiffs attempt to blame their failures on Swanson. As an initial matter, plaintiffs complain about Swanson's being unprepared for his deposition are misplaced. Swanson was not appearing as a corporate designee who was obligated to prepare himself on a specific list of topics. In addition, Swanson can hardly be expected to be prepared to testify for hours on topics unrelated to this litigation. Of course he was unprepared. You asked him irrelevant shit. It's your fault.
Kristen K, this was better. This was better than mine. We're going, going back, back to Tati, Tati. <laughs> it fits much better. It fits much better. For example, the first excerpt quoted in the motion is an extended back and forth based on a question of how Swanson performed services for Flavicure with prominence and diligence in a workman-like manner. I imagine this answer was redacted in the original one. The topic is irrelevant to the case, and the question is difficult, if not impossible, to answer, yet plaintiffs repeated this question for several pages. Plaintiff also included a long excerpt about a company called Amgen, footnote two. The entity's actual name is Amgen, but it was transcribed incorrectly. Oh, it's Amica. <laughs> Amica, a Amica, Amica. Um... At work, answered the phone, and the caller just asked me if I was listening to Emily D. Baker. <laughs> I work. It's me. I'm the one ranting in the background. <laughs> Amica, Arnica, Arnica, Amica, Amica, Arnica. Yes, it's Angen, not Amgen. We're going to use them synonymously. I don't know. Again, plaintiffs spend pages on an irrelevant topic. Again, it's up to the plaintiffs to decide if they're relevant and ask questions about why third parties did certain things related to block cap and amgen, angen, whatever. Swanson answered the questions succinctly and directly. Thus, it's not Swanson's fault. Plaintiffs also include an excerpt where they badger Swanson on his experience with nutraceuticals. There is nothing improper about any of Swanson's answers in this excerpt, which are brief and directly responsive. Further, there's no requirement that a witness answer each question in the exact manner the questioner wishes. Agreed. As to plaintiff's complaints about Swanson's counsel objections, plaintiffs do not specify how many times Swanson's counsel made the supposed improper objection that a document speaks for itself. A review of the transcript indicates the objection was made a total of three times. Three. Further, the two instances of Mr. Swanson's former counsel attempting to clarify a question, a common practice when counsel asks confusing questions, take up less than two pages of the 342-page transcript. Plaintiff's cherry-picked excerpts do not demonstrate Swanson impeding his deposition. Instead, he did his best to answer plaintiff's questions, some of which were poorly, poorly worded. Look, counsel, defense is arguing, if you would like better answers ask better questions this is good to know i don't know if they're the same game on the app store or not but i imagine fruit matching is fruit matching plaintiff's question plaintiff's questions some of which were poorly worded and many of which were irrelevant further plaintiffs are not entitled to an ideal or perfect witness swanson did his best um, to answer the plaintiff's questions in good faith, and Swanson did not impede his deposition. The motion should be denied because it's untimely. Finally, Your Honor, the motion should be denied because it's far too late in discovery to request additional time. They should have argued that first. Um, but if the transcript just got in, then... If a party has an unduly delayed moving to compel discovery, a court may conclude the motion untimely. Here, over a month has passed since Swanson's deposition, and this motion was filed with less than a week left in the discovery period. Plaintiffs have shown no urgency in attempting to compel this additional discovery from Swanson, despite the looming deadline, including failing to request an expedited transcript, waiting two weeks from the party's meet and confer, on this topic to file their motion because plaintiff's request additional deposition time is untimely and unduly delayed, the court should deny. Conclusion, deny it, your honor. Um, And that is the full transcripts, including a deposition Um, that is not sworn an affidavit. I declare as follows, where further affiant say it not. Where's the, like, I declare under penalty of perjury or affiant further saith not or whatever where it's just like signed all right i don't know if there was a reply to this or if the court just ordered it i don't see a reply so we're going to the court minute order on this and then we'll talk a little bit about 
a judge in Oklahoma, and then we'll go to questions. Motion to compel additional time heard in court October 9th. This is the minute order. You can tell by its format. Upon court's inquiry, Mr. Fates stated that this case involved several actions, numerous claims and events which date back several years. Uh, attorney elaborated on the importance of Swanson's deposition and argued that due to Swanson's combative behavior and non-cooperation during deposition testimony, defense counsel was not able to discuss additional cr topics critical to the claims. Attorney for the Westbrooks argued that the delay was attributed to Swanson and as a result, seven additional hours are necessary. McNutt stated that he was new to the case, accepted the discovery deadlines, and believed the matter was over-litigated on trivial matters. Mr. McNutt, what the fuck have you all been doing? <laughs> I'm new to this case, but this seems like a lot. Um, I mean, there's a lot of litigation. I, I don't know who's to blame for that lot of litigation, Mr. McNutt. McNutt stated he was new to the case, accepted the discovery, over litigated, uh, referenced rule 30 and various excerpts in Swanson's deposition to support defendant's position. Additional deposition testimony was not necessary and opposing counsel caused the delay. McNutt requested no more than an additional 90 minutes for additional deposition testimony and stated this would be the seventh deposition taken after the discovery cutoff. That's a lot. Attorney for plaintiffs responded to defendants' punitive effort claims and topic revisitation. Court stated its findings and ordered motion to compel additional deposition testimony of Clark Swanson on OST granted for an additional seven hours of testimony without the court restricting topics. Well... If the court thought that counsel was fucking around, the court would let counsel find out. If counsel wasted time, the court's not going to be inclined to fix it for them. So the court, I'm assuming, reading the transcript, listening to argument, and looking at all the motions, decided that a full seven hours of additional deposition was needed, and the court was not going to limit what they could ask about. The court's like, you need a whole new one. Go ahead. Go ahead. The court directed counsel to provide the court with a date and time for the depot, and in the event the court needed to rule on objections, the court directed defense counsel to prepare the order with detailed findings of fact and conclusions of law and circulate to opposing counsel and submit to the court pursuant to the rules. I have not seen that yet. When it is filed, we will touch on it, but this case is still in discovery. It's still in depositions. So what we know is that Swanson has a new lawyer. That new lawyer is going to be at another deposition. There is another seven hours of depositions happening for Swanson. So obviously the court, the court didn't even ameliorate it or mitigate it or limit it. The court wasn't like, I'll give you three hours. The court was like, yep, no, you, yeah, you, yeah, here's seven. There you go. Another full entire day of depositions. So this case, again, is scheduled for trial in February of 2024. And this jury trial is going to be a very interesting one, isn't it? Yeah, it is. All right. I am going to ask, answer some, well, no, let's go to judge. We've got a little time. We've only been streaming two hours. We've got a little bit of time. We got a little bit of time. Let's go talk about that judge in Oklahoma, shall we? How are you guys doing? Chat, how you doing? How we feeling, everybody? There's over 6,000 of you in here. Go ahead and do the youtube -y things. I don't even ask anymore. I, I should. I, I should ask. I don't. But do the youtube -y things. It would mean a lot. I would appreciate it. So like, like, subscribe, things, those things. Those things will be, uh, would be helpful. And I appreciate you. Thanks. All right. <laughs> Chat, I know. I know our brains are just like, mm-hmm, Suica. All right, let's, what are we doing? We're Oklahoma. Oklahoma, okay. We're just going to go to the ruling, I think, or the petition. Let me swoop. Let me swoop. We've got time. Chat's like, we feel good. Let's go. <gasps> Texting judge. We're feeling great. We've got time. Let's just do it. Let's just do it. All righty. 
Elena said, I drank my coffee out of my Lawnard U mega mug this morning. And my Lawnard U t-shirt is so comfy. I wore it to bed three nights in a row. I love all of that. The mega mugs are fantastic. They're so big. We love it. We love it. We love it. All right. Let's pull up this petition right now. Here's the thing. Judici judiciary, judicial discipline goes through a division of other judges who deal with it. What I have seen most interesting in this case after this was filed, like after the petition to discipline the judge was filed in Oklahoma, and I found out about this case because it has been covered by other lawyers on the platform. Uh, Robin Runkle covered it. And I got a lot of text DMs and all the rest of it. Like, did you see this story? It got picked up by the media some about like what is going on with this texting judge um, and this judge's behavior. So because all of you, a lot of you had seen the story, you were like, Emily, we need to discuss. I am always down for a we need to discuss when it kind of falls within the parameters of what we discuss. So judicial discipline. This is a petition for judicial discipline. What I have seen on the case since then is numerous judges have removed themselves from being able to hear this case because they are witnesses. So there have been like three or th two or three recusals of other judges because those other judges are listed as potential witnesses. So let us swoop and go take a look at them. The one thing I want to bring up from a media article before we go directly to the petition, you know that my preference is always to just go to what it says in court, but this gives context that I don't know if will come up. I have not read the petition for myself yet. Um, let's, oh my God, the advertisements on everything kill me. I forgot to put reader mode on this. It's somewhere. I'll find it later. An Oklahoma judge could be removed from office for sending more than 500 texts during a murder trial. So we're just going to orient ourselves to the story before we go into all the documents. Most courtrooms have security cameras everywhere. This is someone on the bench. This is the court, like you've got the court reporter on their stenography machine. Court reporter, somebody on the witness stand that looks like they are in a jail jumpsuit, so it might be the defendant or a witness. The court clerk doing their work, the judge's notes on the bench, the judge's computer, and the judge's phone. What this says on AP is this is an image from security camera video. The judge, Tracy Saunderstorm, looks at her cell phone during a murder trial, June 12, 2023, at the Lincoln County District Courthouse in Chandler, Oklahoma. Chief Justice of the Oklahoma Supreme Court, John Kane, uh, is recommending the removal of the judge who exchanged more than 500 texts with her bailiff during a murder trial. That's a lot of texts. An investigation by um, the Oklahoma Supreme Court Council on Judicial Complaints found the judge mocked prosecutors, laughed at the bailiff's comment about a prosecutor's genitals, praised the defense attorney, and called the key prosecution witness a liar, according to the petition filed on October 10th. <sighs> Judicial temperament is a thing. A new Oklahoma, a new Oklahoma judge could lose her job. Like if this is how you're acting when you're brand new, it worries me. A new Oklahoma judge could lose her job for sending more than 500 texts to her bailiff during a murder trial, including messages mocking the prosecutor, praising the defense attorney, and calling a key witness a liar. The chief justice recommended the removal. The judge has been under scrutiny since July when she was caught on camera scrolling through social media and texting during the trial of a man accused in a fatal beating of a two-year-old. <sighs> the 
The judge, who was sworn in on January 9th after being elected in November, was suspended with pay pending the outcome of a hearing by the court on the judiciary, which will determine whether to remove her from the bench. The pattern of conduct demonstrates judges' gross neglect of duty, gross partiality, and oppression. The conduct further demonstrates judges' lack of temperament to serve as a judge. A phone call to a number listed for the judge rang unanswered before disconnecting. The judge's text included saying the prosecutor was sweating through his coat during questioning of potential jurors was asking, why does he have baby hands? The text, de- <sighs> the text described the defense attorney as awesome and asked, can I clap for her during the defense attorney's opening arguments? The judge also texted a laughing emoji icon at the bailiff who had made a crass and demeaning reference to the prosecuting attorney's genitals. Um, Defendant, who was on trial while the judge was on her phone, was convicted of second-degree manslaughter in the 2018 death of the son of his girlfriend and sentenced to time served. Um... Okay, how how do you get, I don't know how you get time served on a second degree manslaughter when these are the facts. This is not my case. The, the, okay. The girlfriend and the mother of the child pled guilty to enabling the abuse and was sentenced to 25 years and was a key prosecution witness who was called a liar by the judge. The state couldn't accept that the mom could kill their kids, so they went after the next person available. The judge texted according to the filing. The text includes comments about whether the juror was wearing a wig if a witness has teeth and calling a police officer who testified pretty, adding, I could look at him all day. Oh, okay. So maligning and objectifying. When questioned by the Council on Judicial Complaints, the judge said her texting probably could have waited rather than realizing the comments should never have been made. She said she thought, oh, that's funny, move on. It is a trial regarding a murdered child. How do you not treat that with solemnity and seriousness? How is that a fucking joke? Yes, chat. Yes, chat. Motion is gr- motion is granted. M- motion is granted. Like, I can't think of anything that's more what the fuckery. For those of you that are new, I have granted a DEFCON Red. That means we're going to DEFCON Red. The bumper for DEFCON Red is flashy. The flashing ends when the music ends. So we are going to DEFCON Red in three, two, one. This is why I did not watch other coverage on this because once it was like, this judge is texting inappropriate stuff, I was like, okay, we'll have to take a look. So I wanted to take a look anew. But what I really wanted to know is how the judge got caught. And it seems from a review of security footage, but somebody had to bring that to someone's attention. So I'm gonna go back on the AP. So the AP linked to the other story. I wanna go back to the other story and see what's linked Um, this is from July 20th video shows Oklahoma judge texting and scrolling on phone in trial over fatal beating of child. A new Oklahoma judge is facing scrutiny after courtroom video showed her scrolling through social media and texting throughout the murder trial for a man accused in the fatal beating two year old security video obtained by the Oklahoman shows the judge texting or messaging for minutes at a time during jury selection, opening statements, testimony, and trial for a man in the death of his girlfriend's son. At one point, she is seen searching for a GIF, an animated image. Judge 50 can also be seen checking Facebook during the trial. Judges aren't supposed, okay. Which began last month in Chandler, about 45 miles northeast of Oklahoma City. The judge was sworn in on January 9th after being elected in November. Her Term expires January 27th. She declined to comment to the newspaper because the verdict could still be appealed, 
saying judges are prohibited from discussing pending cases. Now there's some reflection. A request for comment from the Associated Press was not immediately returned Thursday. The trial ended with a conviction um, of second degree manslaughter. Prosecutors had asked the juries to find him guilty of first degree murder, so they found a lesser included. I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of the case. The judge's behavior is what is at issue here. The sheriff said Wednesday that at the request of the Oklahoma Council on Judicial Complaints, he provided the state agency with video from the trial. Who complained? The council receives and investigates uh, accusations of misconduct. The council's director said that by law, their investigations are similar to a grand jury and they are to be held in secrecy. The sheriff said the cameras were placed in the courtroom for safety reasons. He said there's no sound on the audio, which is monitored by his office. The district attorney said he reviewed the video after getting a tip from courthouse personnel. Oh, me. How did this happen? The DA said he reviewed the video after getting a tip from courthouse personnel because courthouses spill all the tea. Spill all the tea. The way I knew about who was having an affair, who was doing what, who was on a new diet, who had taken up CrossFit, courthouses know everything down to who prefers to poop in what bathroom. The amount, they're like hospitals. The amount of information you know at a courthouse is literally all. There are, there are no secrets. It's courthouse officials say anything to the judge. No, they told the prosecutor. It seems that they told the prosecutor, hey, by the way, you need to know. Because the courthouse staff can't really do much. The prosecutor can make a judicial complaint. It's not really for the courthouse staff to make that complaint, especially when she and the bailiff are texting together. Because then, especially if it's courthouse staff that works for the sheriffs, then you're going, then, then there's a whole conundrum of reporting and potentially getting in trouble with one of your colleagues. And that's a whole, that is a whole thing too. Okay, so the DA got a tip and said he found the judge spent hours of the trial texting and scrolling on her cell phone. It's both shocking and disappointing. He told the newspaper, jurors are banned from using cell phones in the courtroom during trials because we expect them to give their full time and attention to the evidence being presented. I would expect and hope the court would hold itself to the same standard required for jurors, regardless of the type of case. That's not too much to ask. Attorney said he never saw her using the phone. The video show the judge held the phone down in her lap below the top of the judge's bench while using it or setting it down in an open drawer. The defense attorney said the judge did a great job and she never saw the judge use the phone. So the courthouse staff told the prosecutor what the judge was up to and the prosecutor, it seems, or the prosecutor's office in general, made a complaint. The video got, after reviewing the video, and then that went to the Judicial Council of Complaints and then they took it seriously and went, that's a problem. That's a problem. But this is a brand new judge. Like the level of audacity for a brand new judge in a case that is so incredibly serious to not be paying attention is bananas. So let's take a look. She was hiding the phone use. She knew it was wrong. It's absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. Okay. This petition is filed pursuant to the Oklahoma Constitution. The respondent, Tracy Soderstorm, shitstorm is what's happening here. This is a shitstorm. I can't call you Judge Shitstorm. We're going to just go with Judge, Judge, just Judge. Oh boy. Respondent is now and has been a district judge in the county, in the 23rd district, which includes the counties, exercising judicial power under the provisions of the Constitution. She was elected November 2022, took the bench on January 9th, 2023. Brand new 
Judge, did you not go to judge school? Okay. The respondent as duly elected and acting district judge exercising judicial power, the grounds upon which removal from office is sought include the following. Like I have seen judges get admonished. Sometimes it is just that the Judicial Council wants to check you before you wreck yourself and they will publicly admonish you for behavior. A lot of the behavior is being curt with other counsel, like being snappish, being being rude. Um, sometimes it's timeliness. Um, sometimes it's showing preference to one party or the other. But generally what the courts will do is do a published admonishment. This judge has been admonished, so you're aware. And if the they don't ask for removal first, asking for removal first is is a giant, a giant ask, which means this is going to be really bad. Because otherwise, they would be like, you shouldn't be texting. This is going to be worse than that when we get to the allegations here that are gross neglect of duty, gross partiality in office, oppression in office, and other grounds grounds the other grounds specified in subsection c provide that violation by a judicial officer of the code may constitute grounds for removal by the court on the judiciary of a judicial officer from office with or without disqualification to hold the judge office in the future so they can remove the judge and the judge could be reelected depending on what they do this is not an action for disbarment note this is not an action for disbarment. This is an action to remove her from the office of judge. They are not asking to disbar her. She could get removed from her office as judge and still practice as a lawyer. All right. So this goes through other grounds, the canons of judicial conduct. Canon one, a judge shall uphold and promote the independence, integrity, and impartiality of the judiciary and shall avoid impropriety and the appearance of impropriety. You shall, like, comply with the law. A judge shall act at all times in a manner that promotes public confidence in the independence, integrity, and impartiality of the judiciary. Perform duties of a judicial office impartially, competently, and diligently. A judge should uphold and apply the law, perform all duties of a judicial office fairly and impartially. A judge shall perform the duties of judicial office, including administrative duties, without bias or prejudice. They shall not, in the performance of their duties, by words or conduct, manifest bias or prejudice, or engage in harassment, including but not limited to uh, bias, prejudice, harassment based upon race, sex, gender, religion, national origin, ethnicity, disability, age, sexual orientation, marital status, socio socioeconomic status, or political affiliation, and shall not permit court staff, court officials, or others subject to the judicial, subject to the judge's discretion and control to do so. You're the judge. A judge, uh, let's see, a judge shall perform judicial and administrative duties competently and diligently, cooperate with other judges and court officials, should hear and decide matters assigned to them, except when disqualification is required. You get the point. You must do the things. These are all the rules. Uh, dignity, impartiality, integrity, the things you would expect of a judge. The respondent's conduct giving rise to these charges is based on the report from counsel. Let's see what the report from counsel is. While presiding over a murder trial beginning on June 7th, the respondent exchanged over 500 text messages with her bailiff, in which she mocked the physical appearance of the attorneys, jurors, and witnesses, and used offensive language to deride the state's attorneys. The respondent and her bailiff called murder trial witnesses liars, admired the looks of a police officer who was testifying, disparaged the local defense bar, expressed bias in favor of the defendant, and displayed gross partiality against the state. 
Respondent and her bailiff texted back and forth with each other continuously during the active portions of the murder trial. So not even when like people were walking up to the stand, like I can see, I can see a judge asking their bailiff or court clerk, normally they do this by email, bailiff or court clerk, do we have any custody pickups we have to deal with today? What is our scheduling for the rest of the day? Do we need to stop at any time? I can see those types of conversations happening when witnesses are changing over, when the prosecutor prosecutors introducing themselves. But judges have to pay attention because then they have to rule on what's happening in court. So they have to listen to the witness. And then if the attorney is like objection hearsay, you have to have just heard what was said. So you have to be actively paying attention to that. I don't know how you do that while sending 500 texts because it seems that the nature of these texts are not what time do we need to stop today? Do we have any other matters to handle? Respondent placed her personal cell phone towards the front of her lap outside the view of others in the courtroom. Oh, not outside the view of the cameras. Respondent was scrolling Facebook. What is even on Facebook that you need when you're presiding over a murder trial? Like be present. accessing various phone applications and texting for extended periods of time. What were you playing Suica game? Two dots, love and pies. What were you playing on your phone? Your honor, the bailiff sitting in a witness box or at a small desk near the respondent sent and received text messages during the murder trial as well. I imagine that disciplinary action is going through their department. <clears throat> on a separate occasion, the respondent and bailiff discussed by text, which juror, which jury instructions would best fit their desired outcome? What in the fucking hell? Wait a second. The respondent and bailiff, first of all, Judges discuss jury instructions with the lawyers and then their court clerk. Jury instructions are of huge import. We have covered that on this channel when jury instructions come up. And I'm like, I know a lot of people, jury instructions can be boring, but the litigation over jury instructions can shift the outcome of a case. Litigation over jury instructions is hugely important. To discuss which jury instructions would fit their desired outcome is so unprofessional and biased. Judges don't have a desired outcome. Judges preside over a fair trial. Oh my God. Okay, so that is so improper, it's unbelievable. Um. Also, you shouldn't be discussing jury instructions with your bailiff. Also, there's like a list of jury instructions that you give that are like prescribed by law and then the lawyers ask for other ones and then you rule on them. Oh! I can't. Desired outcome. After publicly regarding the respondent's excessive phone use during trial, the respondent had the security camera moved where she could not be observed. What? Moved the camera. When the camera was subsequently returned to its original location, a black box was inserted to block out the bottom half of the viewing area so that the judge could not be seen. The blocking was eventually removed. We're only on page eight. The pattern of conduct demonstrates respondents gross neglect of duty, gross partiality. It's just fucking gross. We are allowed to expect better of professionals. This is unacceptable fuckery. It is a job that you have to take seriously because you are literally, especially in criminal, presiding over people's freedom. You 
are this you are the separation of powers that is supposed to block between government overreach and the public oh my god oh my god oh my god oh my god the case um i'm not going to get into the details of the case it's awful Defendant was held without bond until his trial began on June 7th, 2023. The homicide occurred in 2019. The state was represented by the attorney, Adam uh, Painter, assistant attorney, Ryan Stevenson, defendant, um, Christian Marzal was represented by uh, Velia Lopez and Greg Graves, capital trial counsel for the Oklahoma in, uh, indigent defense. I wonder if they this could have been because capital trial counsel means that this could have been at some point a capital offense if they had convicted a first degree four weeks prior to trial the state filed a notice of endorsement of personal witness to include dr ryan brown the defendant filed a dauber motion the respondent did not hear the motion at a motion hearing on may 30th and took the motion under advisement following the jury trial call docket the assistant district attorney, the ADA, asked the court to rule specifically on the motion prior to the jury's being, jurors being sworn and alerted, alerted the court that the timing of the ruling would determine whether the state could appeal an unfavorable decision. On June 7th, the court took up the outstanding issues before Vordire, uh, but then brought in the jury and stated she would take up the remaining issues later. Once you swear the jury, jeopardy attaches. I see where the DA is worried. Because the DA is like, if you don't rule before the jury is seated, Jeopardy attaches, and then I can't appeal anything. Once Jeopardy attaches, it does not matter. The state cannot appeal. No matter what the judge does wrong, the constitutional right of the defendant overrides everything. The DA again asked at the that the evidentiary matters be settled before the jury was sworn. Reasonable. The defense attorney agreed because they're professionals, saying they like for the motion to be argued and solved so they know what they can ask and what can be said. You need to know that in voir dire. Respondents said they would maybe take it up that afternoon when they got to the point of swearing the panel. While the DA was addressing the jurors during voir dire, respondent texted that he was sweating through his coat, to which bailiff responded, yes, it's gross, he's gross and a horrible speaker. Regarding the ADA, the respondent commented that they're going to hate him, referring to the jury as they. The bailiff responded, absolutely, he's an arrogant asshole. The bailiff then made a crass and demeaning reference to the prosecuting attorney's genitals, to which the respondent replied with a ha-ha icon. The DA made a reference to a BLT sandwich, and the bailiff remarked that the defense attorney threw his BLT analogy back at him. The respondent replied, trash, with various emojis referencing trash and a BLT. At no time during these exchanges did respondent admonish her bailiff not to discuss the attorneys appearing before the court in such an inappropriate way. Instead, the respondent joined in on the commentary by again referencing the DA's appearance, appearance and stating, why does he have baby hands? They are so weird looking. The bailiff replied, I was told they were tiny, LOL. Conversely, when the defense attorney addressed the jury during voir dire, the respondent remarked, she's awesome. And the bailiff responded, yep, and she's so smart. Following the voir dire, the judge sought to swear the jurors and the state objected. Of course they objected. They wanted the ruling. Again, requesting a ruling on the ability to testify and noting the state would lose its right to an appeal and double jeopardy would attach once the jurors were sworn in. The DA said he thought all parties agreed. They did agree. The respondent overruled the state subjection and swore in the jury. The hearing was held two days after the jury was sworn. The respondent, the judge, sustained the motion and the doctor was not allowed to testify. During opening argument, judge continued to praise the defense attorney by texting her bailiff, can I clap for her? No, you, no, no, you can't. Referencing the DA's office, the respondent noted they are not used to going up against competent attorneys, implicitly dismissing the capabilities 
of the state's attorneys and the defense bar. When the DA began to question witnesses, the bailiff texted, he's horrible, to which the respondent replied, true, to which the bailiff replied, sucks. While a video was played to a witness on the stand, respondent remarked to the bailiff, this shit is boring. Have you never been in court before? A lot of it's boring. You're the judge. It. Okay. I mean, it's not necessarily wrong, but it's your job. It's, it's a murder trial. Ah. Witness. It's the question is, how was this woman seated as a judge? I think it is very hard for the electorate to know how a person will be as a judge. I think it's very difficult for the public to assess judicial temperament. When I look at judicial races, I, A, I know a lot of people who are judges. So the people I know, I can independently assess that because I worked in the court system. For most, you need to look at the legal publications and see what the legal publications say about judicial candidates because the legal publications will generally tell you what their colleagues say about them. And other lawyers can generally assess somebody's judicial temperament by knowing them. It is very, very difficult when you go to elect a judge to know. A lot of people vote based on name and gender. And it is not their fault. Most people don't pay attention to judge elections because it doesn't, they don't even know how to assess the information. Um, Anna said, where do you find legal publications? I would Google them in your area and see who is endorsing judges or go to the judicial website. Um, I saw the question, why elect them? I think there's a lot of reasons. And if we get into all of them, I don't think we're ever going to get through the day. But it includes, you know, allowing the public to choose their judges and allowing the public to eat their judges. If the public does not like them or sees stuff like this, if she doesn't get removed from the bench, the folks in Oklahoma that saw these stories could vote her off the bench. Someone else can run against her and they can eat the judge. So... All right. So we've gotten to this shit is boring. I mean, think it, don't say it. While an interview was played, the bailiff mistakenly thought it was a video that the state had previously lost. Respondent said they didn't lose this one, but they should have. The bailiff replied, it doesn't help the state at all, to which respondent affirmed by texting, nope. Later, the respondent texted, state should just accept that a mom could kill their kid, so they went after, state just couldn't accept that the mom could kill their kids. So they went after the next person available, evidencing her opinion about the defendant's innocence. That's not neutral and impartial. Um, for those of you asking in the chat, yes, the news articles said she is 50. Respondent later texted, this is dumb during the state's direct examination of a witness. Bailiff said, I just hope the jury doesn't buy his shit. Respondent said, he looks constipated. Is that the oh shit look? The judge and her bailiff referred to the co-defendant who was to appear as a witness as a liar at least three times while she is on the stand. What are you doing? The respondent spent a majority of co-defendant's testimony on her phone texting comments like, can I please scream liar, liar? Excuse me, your honor, you're the judge. If you would like to scream liar, liar at witnesses, um, get a YouTube channel. Go ahead. Do what you want to do. You're the judge. You don't, your job is to be impartial a neutral arbiter of the facts.
Also, I don't scream liar, liar at witnesses when I watch trial because the jury gets to decide that, not me, not y'all. We just get to watch and be like, huh, that's odd testimony. I wonder how that's going to land with the jury. The respondent, oh, when a police officer took the stand, the respondent texted, he's pretty, I could look at him all day. I mean, sadly, that's not the first time I've ever heard of a judge objectifying a police officer. That shit happens a lot. To which the bailiff replied, same. When respondent and bailiff also discussed whether one of the jurors is wearing a wig, the respondent texted, that's a wig, look at that hairline. And later texted, definitely wearing a wig. To which bailiff responded, oh my God, lol. There's a lot of reasons why people might wear wigs. Why are we mocking them? They wondered if another witness had teeth. The respondent texted, the judge texted, no, star witness right there. Okay, so they're assholes. Regarding another witness, the respondent questioned, is she blinking uncontrollably? Good, good. Jesus Christ. Later, the respondent offered her opinion to the bailiff that DNA excluded defendant on the bed, no way they get guilty on murder. During the trial, respondent ap approached, the judge approached Sergeant Kelly, Captain Chad, and Detective Larry in the hallway, Kelly, Larry, and Chad, and stated that the co-defendant was not believable. Why are you talking to other officers about the case while it's in progress? She did not think the defendant would be found guilty of murder and he would only be sentenced to credit for time served. Oh, so she made up her mind before the jury ever came back. She granted the defendant's request for an additional jury instruction on manslaughter two, which carries a sentence of two to four years. She took the state's request for a murder two instruction, which is an 85% crime with punishment for 10 years under advisement. So the judge dropped it from first degree murder to manslaughter instead of murder two. That's how it got there. When discussing jury instructions with her bailiff who was traveling at the time by text, the respondent notified her that we are giving an alternative instruction of second degree manslaughter. Bailiff responded, but no, just enabling child abuse. He didn't kill that kid. Respondent answer, no, man two fits can't just do enabling because there is a dead person, child, like baby. The bailiff responded, so basically mom taking the plea deal screwed him over. The respondent reassured the bailiff, no, man two is two to four years, enabling is 255 to life. I'd rather give the man two instruction. Bailiff responded, oh, and he's already served that. Respondent replied, yep. When people put their fingers on the scale of justice, it's a problem. When that person is the judge, it's a real big fucking problem. Later that day, respondent denied the state's request for a murder to jury instruction on the basis that the request was made without sufficient evidence or notice. If you're going to give man to, why not give murder? The state then requested the enabling child abuse instruction instead, and the defense objected because there was a dead body, arguing that the case law arguing there was case law to support the objection. The defense ultimately withdrew the objection because the case law mentioned did not support their position, but the respondent then allowed the enabling child abuse instruction. The jury found the defendant guilty of manslaughter in the second degree and sentenced him to time served, a sentence only a judge could impose. Respondent accepted the verdict and imposed the sentence of four years, giving credit for time served with no additional time. After trial, a sheriff's deputy advised the DA's office the respondent was seen using her phone throughout the trial. The DA then concluded that the respondent frequently sustained objections for facts not in evidence during his closing because the judge had not, in fact, heard whether the facts were in evidence because she was not paying attention. That's what did it. The objections during closing. I was wondering how this all came up. Judge frequently sustained, sustained objections for facts not in evidence during the DA's closing argument because the judge had not, in fact, heard whether the facts or reasonable inferences therefrom were in evidence because she was not paying attention. That's why you need to pay attention.
Um, it's obvious that this was not a fair trial and needs to be done over. It can't. Can this be retried? No. Uh, double jeopardy applies. So unless the defense appeals for some reason, double jeopardy applies. The state, the state cannot appeal. The person's been convicted. The state can't, the state can't do anything because double jeopardy is applied. I see the question in the chat again, will the judge be disbarred? They're not asking to disbar the judge. They are trying to, the, the state bar would have, this is, Emily, one sentence at a time. <laughs> Pick one, go with it first. This is the judicial council looking at removing the judge from being a judge. The disciplinary actions for lawyers are different than the disciplinary actions for judge. So the judge can be removed from office, but they are not moving to disbar the judge as an attorney yet. Could they do that on these facts? Probably. Are they going to? We'll see. After becoming aware that a 51 minute video snippet of the trial had be, been, after becoming aware that a 51 minute video snippet of the trial had been publicized, showing respondents excessive amount of time on her phone, the camera was moved forward at the judge's request to exclude her desk from view. The move left a gaping hole in the ceiling. The camera was later moved back to its original location, but a black box was inserted to block out the bottom half of the viewing area so the judge's desk could not be seen. The county commissioners voted to remove any obstructions from the camera's viewing area. Oh boy. Reasoning that judge was not the only judge using the courtroom and that the other judge, Judge Mueller, not Bueller, Mueller, did not have a problem with the original placement. While on vacation, Mueller received a phone call from a courthouse employee who told her the respondent said she either couldn't be trusted and or better watch her back in light of the county commissioner's decision. Oh, oh boy. Do not start shit with the other judges. They will end it. Oh. Oh, I imagine getting that phone call, Judge Mueller was, don't start none if you don't want none. I can, I can see in my brain how this would play out at a courthouse. Like, this viscerally. Um, Heather Copeland is like, that sounds like a threat. It is. It seems like a threat to me. Also seems like a threat to me. Not that I haven't seen judges threaten each other before, because I absolutely have witnessed that firsthand. The thing with the black robes is that um, differences of opinion plus ego plus frustration can all like lead to things. But for a new judge to have this level of audacity is really crazy. Just really crazy. She better watch her back. You better watch your back because like I'm doing shit at work I'm not supposed to do and you're going to got, get me caught. Yes, Olivia, catch me outside. How about that? Exactly. Exactly. Threatening another judge to cover up her own unethical, improper behavior. She's a new judge. Yeah. This judge has been on this bench six months. Six months. Took the, bench in, took the bench in January. This is going down in what, June, July? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can't, I can't. When the respondent testified before the Council on Judicial Complaints about these matters, she stated that she was texting about things that were probably could have waited. Instead of recognizing that these types of communications should never be made at all. Excuse me, ma'am, you've missed the point. The respondent attempted to mislead the council. Oh, fucking hell. That's never going to go well. The council of other judges are not going to be pleased. 
The respondent also attempted to mislead the counsel regarding the timing of her text messages by stating that most of the time she was texting between when a witness would come on or off the stand and there was a pause. Ma'am, there's video. Judges take their shit real serious. Like real, real, like real serious. So telling other judges that it's like, like, you know, it's like no big deal. Like I'm writing a novel. Like I'm just texting about the novel I'm writing about a Mexican prison. Like I just, I'm, you know, and there was a 4th of July celebration. And like, I was just like texting about my novel. So it's really not like, I guess I could have waited, but it's really like, you know, it's like, not like, like a problem. Right. Cause I'm like, I'm just like texting about my book. It's a novel. Like some of it's true, but like most of it's not true, but like it's an, it's that. Okay. So, however, the timing of the messages align with the time on the video that shows that the texting did not occur during breaks. Uh-huh. Cause there's video and cell phone evidence. Nick White, this judge is literally telling the bailiff to walk the dog. When asked if she recognized it was inappropriate at the time, she explained, it was like, oh, that's funny. No, why would it be inappropriate? It's like, oh my God, it's funny, but like you had to be there because he like totally has baby hands though. Like, of course we were making fun of the prosecutor. Like DAs are the worst. Eh, such a drag. Those weird baby hands. Ew. Like if you were there, you would totally have gotten it. Like you would totally get it. Like... You just had to be there. Like, it wasn't that bad. Like, ha ha. What? <sighs> the totality of the text messages gives the appearance respondent believed that the defendant was innocent and that she wanted a particular outcome on the case. That appearance and various decisions she made during the case, such as refusing to rule on the Dauber motion and denying the state's request for a murder two instruction after privately expressing her personal preference for a particular jury instruction, give the appearance that the respondent may have taken actions in furtherance of a desired outcome. Like the other stuff is distasteful. This shit is so deeply, deeply disturbing. The respondent exhibited an absence of objectivity. No shit. And respondent's communications with the bailiff and others reflect a judge who wholly abandoned her neutral role. Lack of temperament for judicial office, harassment, bias, failure to supervise, lack of candor with disciplinary authorities. Lawyers are obligated to bring candor to the court. You don't lose that when you are a judge being questioned by other judges. Why is this talking about hot pink chairs? Chat, what the fuck is happening? In late January, the respondent told a courthouse employee she was going to have men photographed in hot pink chairs in her chambers and her bailiff was going to hang the photographs on her wall. Respondent specifically declared, What? It would be funny. Huh? <laughs> what? Like, it's totally fine. Thereafter, the Council on Judicial Complaints received an allegation that the male attorneys were being asked to, what? Wait, what, this, what, what? No, no, she's not just going to have a photo shoot of men in hot pink chairs. No, no, we're not going to magic mic this shit. No, she's asking attorneys in the courthouse to pose for pictures? To pose for pic... How is this still getting worse? How is this still getting worse? Like, I realize that the sexual harassment of female attorneys is a thing and has been a thing for a very long time. But what you're not going to do is try to, like... Balance it out by harassing the male attorneys. How about we just don't harass any of the attorneys? Like, let attorneys just do their job. Uh, 
What? It would be funny. She was asking the male attorneys to pose for pictures in the chair. And the pictures were displayed in the outer chambers. Generally, judicial chambers will have like an antechamber and then a, a chamber. Oftentimes, that's where you will either just be a hallway walkthrough or have a table where you will do meetings received an allegation that male attorneys were being asked to pose for pictures in pink chairs and that the pictures were being displayed. Did some of them do it? Some of them must have done it. Hannah in the chat said, a chamber of secrets, a chamber of fucking harassment. <sighs> there were no picture of women in chairs. Some of the men reported feeling uncomfortable but they did not feel like they could refuse. Of course they felt uncomfortable. What weird fucking shit is this? Hey, come to my chambers. Let me photograph you. It's funny. What? No. Can you loosen up your tie just a little? Can you lean? Just like, just give me the smolder. Okay. To the camera. Can we just, okay, no, but I want you to like spread the legs more and lean in. Give me blue steel. Like, what the fuck is happening? Oh, my God. Some of the men reported feeling uncomfortable. No fucking shit. Excuse me, officer. Can you come to my chambers? Yeah, no. But with just like your utility belt? Mm-hmm. Oh, and your boots. Mm-hmm. Utility belt, boots. In the pink chair. Yes, yes. And then we're going to take pictures. Folks, don't objectify the people that you work with. It's so bad. Some of the men reported feeling uncomfortable. Of course, of course they did. Of course they did. And I don't mean to make light of the men feeling uncomfortable. I was trying to exemplify how fucking disgusting it was. Um... Assistant DA told the judge and the bailiff that the wall of male pictures was sexist. Prior to this comment, the bailiff asked defense attorney uh, Shelly Levisay if she wanted to take a picture in the chairs for the sole purpose of making it seem like it was not sexist. And Levisay declined. After the ADA comment, the respondent judge did not ask the bailiff to remove the pictures, but commented, you're going to get me in trouble with these pink chairs. Oh, so she just turned around and threw the threw the bail threw the bailiff under the bus. Um, bailiff, at that point, you should have transferred courthouse, courtrooms at least. You should have not been texting buddy buddy about the genitalia of the prosecutor with this woman who's willing to throw you the fuck under the bus. You're gonna get me in trouble. You're going to get me in trouble with these chairs. Like, we're asking men to just take these pictures and then we're putting them all over the walls in a really fucking weird way. Just don't exploit people. It's fucking weird. It's not funny. It's just... We... What? After receiving the council's inquiry, so this has been going on and on and on, Respondent denied that any of the attorneys were being forced to have their pictures taken. It's inappropriate to ask. And stated, there were photographs of both male and female attorneys hanging in my bailiff's office that she took. Those photographs are provided. The photographs are pictures of two female attorneys, which were taken in the bailiff's cell phone on April 13th, 2023. Yeah, after this. In the afternoon, after respondent received the complaint and falsely submitted it to the council as though the pictures existed all along. Ma'am, did you not practice law enough to learn that anything taken on a cell phone is time stamped? And what you can't do is tell the judicial council, what? It's fine. See, there's pictures of women, too, that were taken after they called you out. Y'all are trying to kill me. All of you were just like, hey, 
let's do this. Yes. Also, the fact that she's a judge and is in a position of power. Y'all are trying to make my head explode. I can see why I got so many DMs about this case. I worked for judges, lovely judges. I, I just, I am friends with lovely judges. I can't wrap my head around all of this. Sin said, you're so much handsomer when you smile. Mm. Okay. The bailiff stated, the judge got the complaint. I called her office, said that Tracy needed her, needed them, and I took the pictures without the judge knowing, trying to protect the judge because the pink chairs were my fault. Not the bailiff coming in with, it was my fault. Ma'am, you work for the judge. Also, if that's true, the judge should have been like, what you can't do in my courtroom is this. So maybe call the fire department and ask them if they want to do like a, you know, men of whatever fire department calendar and go shoot that. If you want to be a, a, a sassy photographer, take the pink chairs to the fire department for breast cancer awareness or something, but not the attorneys that work in the courthouse. There was a courtroom that I worked in that took Polaroids of every attorney that worked in the courtroom just at council table. And I was like, why though? Oh, we've got a, you know, photo album of all the attorneys that have worked here. But why though? No, don't. Somewhere I'm in that book. Cause they're like, no, we, we do it with everybody. I'm like, mm, I, I don't like it though. Yes, binders of lawyers. I, but I was a brand new attorney. And it's like, we do that. We, we keep it. We keep a photo album of everybody. I'm like, but why? I don't know. My photo's in that book. Because brand new attorney. And then I went to one of the defense attorneys and was like, why? I don't like any of this. Okay. Um, two female attorneys came with another attorney at the firm and the three testified that the bailiff called her around lunch and said, the judge needs you, but gave no additional information. When they arrived, respondent was on the bench. And while waiting for the judge, the bailiff offered to take their picture. Are you also trying to cast them in a part? When the respondent entered her chambers and told them about the complaint, which read, it is alleged that, you're re that you've required male, but not female attorneys to pose for photographs in pink chairs located in your chambers. None of the women mentioned that they just had their pictures taken in the pink chairs. Judge alleges she didn't know the pictures were taken that day. Judge testified when she turned over the pictures of the female attorneys in the pink chairs to her attorney, she thought they were pictures that were already hanging. The fuck you did. How many pictures are there on the wall that you can't keep track of whose photos are there? What? Respondent testified she later learned on Wednesday of last week that they were not. Respondent testified she asked the bailiff about the pictures and the bailiff told her she did not take the pictures before respondent got the complaint. Respondent testified on July 19th Respondent judge testified July 19th was the first time she learned that the photos of the female attorneys were taken. Why is this bailiff trying to get her back? Bullock testified judge knew about the female attorneys being photographed after the complaint was received long before Wednesday of last week. Bullock testified the women had multiple conversations about the complaints, pink chair, and pictures. Oh, this is all that they're talking about in this courthouse. There's no way everyone in this fucking courthouse and all the surrounding courthouses don't know everything about this everything about this all of it everyone knows everyone in this legal community knows exactly what the fuck is happening 
and are are literally texting one another being like did this judge make you take weird pictures at a pink chair what the fuck is this about Bullock testified the women had multiple conversations about the complaints, pink chair, and pictures, including a conversation in early May at a girls' dinner or in late June at a conference when Kelly specifically told Judge about being photographed. Your Honor, what the fuck's up with the weird pink chairs? Judge, at best, knew that the May 18th response and evidence provided to counsel was false in June 2023. At worst, she knew in early May. And at the time they were submitted, where she knew in early May at the time they were submitted that the pictures are fabricated. So let me get this straight. This judge has sexually harassed people that work at her courthouse or harassed people that work at her courthouse. We don't know the full nature of the pictures. I made an assumption. Has at least harassed people that work in her courthouse. Has lied to the Judicial Council investigating her more than once. When complaints were made about the cell phone use, moved the camera not to check the behavior, but to hide it better. Matt, the future ESQ is asking, can this turn into a class action? This is not a lawsuit, so no. This is a judicial action against this judge, and we're only 18 pages in and my head's about to explode. Despite testifying to the counsel that the false statements and evidence she submitted were attributable to her bailiff, Judge has not terminated her bailiff as an employee for not only allegedly lying to her, but for also allegedly causing her to submit false evidence to an investigating body. I think they're using allegedly because they don't believe that this is the bailiff's fault. That's my interpretation. It's like my opinion. The conduct shows a lack of, lack of temperament to serve as a judge and demonstrates impropriety, bias based on gender, failure to properly supervise court staff, failure to cooperate with, and to be honest and candid with judicial disciplinary agencies. The amount of stuff we put up with as lawyers sometimes. There was another judge that just didn't like working with female attorneys. And there were offices that were like, we'll only sell male attorneys there then. We'll just, we'll send the dudes. This judge will be easier to deal with if we just send the dudes. <sighs> Decorum and bias. On February 14th, Valentine's Day, the state, the DAs, sought to increase bond for a defendant because additional counts of lewd acts with a child were added to his preliminary were added at his preliminary hearing and he was charged in another county with ludax with a child and was arrested in Kansas these are very serious allegations the defendant's girlfriend was present during the hearing to testify but was never called while waiting for a deputy to i'm i'm already having the ick about all of this while waiting for a deputy to arrive and remand defendant to jail Judge addressed the girlfriend without prompting by saying, Miss Argo, I don't know how long that you and the defendant have been dating, but you might want to reconsider your life choices in this case. <sighs> the girlfriend responded, I've read the preliminary hearing, Your Honor, and the judge snapped back, I'm sorry. The defense attorney stepped in to tell the respondent that he had advised the witness to remain silent. Ma'am, it is none of your business. 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 I have seen judges say tremendously kind things when a case is done. You guys watched the sentencing in the Brooks case with me. And the judge gave, I thought, a lot of compassion to those that testified, to the victims, to the, um, the things that they have been through, through the courage that it takes, and addressed that during sentencing. 
at the end of a case. This is commenting on a defendant's alleged behavior after a preliminary hearing before the case is resolved, which means this individual is still innocent until proven guilty. The allegations are bad. You might think in your brain, um, ma'am, this is, this is not the person you want to date. But it's not appropriate to say it off the bench. Because, again, these are allegations. Okay. And then got pissed that the response was, I know. I've, I, I'm aware. I am a sentient being that is aware of what's happening and capable of making my own life choices. Thanks, Your Honor. Oh, gosh. On February 28th, the state, through the DAs, were scheduled to appear before defend uh, before judge in State B. Kempf. The agreement between the state and the defendant was to dismiss the original charge of lewd or indecent acts with a child under 16 in exchange for a new charge on three counts of child abuse. Is this judge in a specialty court? Uh, it's giving specialty court. With like the most vulnerable victims because the types of cases that are coming before this judge are consistently, there are three now that they have talked about, all of them involve harm to children. Is this a specialty court? Because that's a lot of cases that are in the similar classification. So this is a third defendant. This is Ludax, looter and decent acts to a child in exchange for child abuse charges. And the defendant will be sentenced one week in the county jail and five years suspended. The original charge was filed by the prior administration of the DA's office and the prior administration agreed to offer the defendant only a suspended sentence on reduced charges prior to the hearing. The DA's office spoke with the victims in the case and discussed the plea agreement and the prior administration versus this new plea agreement and advised of the victim's right to appear at the hearing on the day of the hearing. The victims failed to appear, but the state noted one victim submitted an impact statement and that the victims had been made aware of the agreement. The defense attorney stated on the record he concurred with the state's restatement of their communications and notices of both the defendants and the victims. After accepting the plea, the respondent stated, the judge stated, oh, if I could force the district attorney to take this case to trial, I would not be giving you such a light sentence. It's not your place. On September 17th and again on May 18th, judge directed an email to the local defense bar. The defense bar, the DA's office, and other court officials stating the following is required for matters that will be entering a plea. The minimum required community service hours is 100. Ma'am. So the DA's office is part of the executive branch, right? Because they're fulfilling the duties of the legislative branch. But you are part of the judicial branch. And there's this thing under the Constitution under which you serve called separation of power powers it's not your job you are the arbiter you are not the da's office you have to follow the law if the da's office is doing something that contravenes the law that is a problem and you can say hey i can't do that the law says this but you can't make up arbitrary requirements you can't do that This is not your job. Who started papering her? I need to know how many attorneys just started papering this judge. Like this case is assigned to this judge and they're like, no, it's not. Did we just pay? Who's papering this judge? Paper, paper. This is assigned to this judge, negative. We're not doing that. We're not appearing before this judge. No way, no way. 
I wonder when that started, if it started. I've got questions. I've got questions for the ADAs practicing in this jurisdiction. Were you just papering this job for every case that was assigned to this judge? And if not, why do that? Following the court's acceptance of the plea, one of the victims published a Facebook post stating her disagreement with the plea and the judge's sentence. The judge's bailiff provided a copy of the Facebook post to the judge. It's none of your business. That is between the DA's office and the victims. Judges can refuse to accept pleas. That can happen. What is papering? I appreciate this question. It is, uh, you are allowed to paper a judge saying you are not, you, you are not appearing before that judge. So I don't know what it's, uh, what code section it would fall under in Oklahoma. In California, it's a 170.6 objection to the judge. So you can object to the judge. It is, it is, you have a paper that you sign and you go, no. You do it at the earliest point where the case is assigned to that judge. And judges can recuse themselves. Attorneys can paper the judge saying, I'm not going to bring this case before you. So one of the victims published a Facebook post stating disagreement. This has nothing to do with this judge. The judge then told an employee of the courthouse that the state lied to her. And this was the second time they've lied to her and it's two strikes, you're out. Ma'am, go to the head of the DA's office. If you feel that the DA's are lying to you, you need to go talk to the DA's office and probably the defense attorney's office. And be like, uh-uh. Although the plea agreement did not include community service, she further advised the defendant that she requires a minimum of 100 hours of community service. These are not your plea agreements to make. With all plea agreements and was adding that to his sentence to be completed within six months, that's not your job. During a conversation with judge in chambers, the DA asked her about this case. She stated, your district attorney lied to me. We'll discuss that on the record. Yeah, pull him in. Pull him in and have a chat on the record. Fine. A hearing was held on the record. Keep reading, Emily. A hearing was held on the record on April 25th, but defense counsel was not given notice of the hearing, even though the defendant was given a suspended sentence and any revocation would be heard by the judge. Can't do that. On the record, judge accused the DA's office of lying to her because a victim posted on Facebook that she did not agree with the plea deal. Victims don't always agree with plea deals. Doesn't mean they weren't notified of it. Respondent then stated she was filing a bar complaint against the attorney to investigate the issue. Ma'am, that's rich. Your attorney should be investigated. Ma'am? To date, judge has not filed a bar complaint. Oh, you were just threatening them. Hmm. Don't do that. Individuals commenting on the Facebook post were not complimentary of the judge's role in the sentence, suggesting that she should not have accepted it or that it was her idea. A judge can choose to not accept a plea. Your Honor, we've agreed to this plea deal. The judge can say no. Respondent's bailiff provided the comments to the Facebook post to the judge at her request. Why? This is not, this is not going to go well. Judge attempted to mislead counsel in testifying to the contrary. Judge testified that the bailiff did not provide her the comments after the Facebook post, that she had not seen the comments, and that she did not ask the bailiff to provide them to her. Oh, so then she's again throwing her bailiff under the bus. Judge to bailiff, probably. Oh my God, but what are they saying about me? Are they talking about me on Facebook? Like, what did they say? What did they say about me? Do they talk about my hair? Do they think I'm cute? Do they like me? Please tell me that they like me. Wait, they don't like me? Fuck them. Do you, do you have a Slack account? Like, do you have a Slack account? Okay, I'm gonna need you to go on Facebook and be like, oh my God, totes, that's not even it. This judge is way dope. Okay. I need to know if there were any sock accounts involved in responding to these. Chat, you keep telling me it gets worse. <sighs> oh, I can't. I can't. I can't. On March 21st, the DAs, 
appeared before judge alongside defense attorney in a different case. Conley. For the defendant to enter an agreed plea of not guilty by reason of mental illness on various felony charges related to a fatal auto accident. Okay, maybe not a specialty court. The victim's family was present in the courtroom and asked the ADA to read a victim's impact statement to the court. Respondent judge signed a journal entry finding the defendant not guilty by reason of mental illness, which provided the defendant would present to the Oklahoma Forensic Center for an examination to determine whether the defendant is presently, presently mentally ill and a danger to the public peace or safety. I imagine this is a docket entry. The journal entry further ordered the parties to appear back within 45 days for a hearing to ascertain whether there was a need for continued supervision based on the underlying examination. Multiple witnesses in the courtroom that day affirm it was obvious the parties were present for a plea and sentencing. So the judge wasn't going to do the plea and sentencing. On March 27th, judge entered an order vacating the March 21st entry because it contains inaccurate statements and findings. That's odd. Resp judge indicated others to others following the hearing that the state lied to her in their presentation of the case because she did not understand when signing the journal entry that the defendant would not be punished. She thought she was sending the defendant to the forensic center to determine whether she could stand trial. Was she on her phone and that's why she missed what they said? If there are victims, families in the courtroom with victims impact statements, everyone knew what they were there for. So she misunderstood and then tried to blame everybody else. Judge instituted a policy that all plea paperwork must get, be completed with a copy delivered to her chambers no later than Friday before the Tuesday disposition docket. Things aren't always done by then. Lincoln County Attorney Thompson mentioned to respondent that it was a hardship for him to prepare and deliver out of custody plea paperwork on Friday before Tuesday disposition docket. Respondent, res judge responded to attorney, it's not you I'm worried about, it's the DAs. They've given me a reason in the past not to trust them. Melissa Missy Johnson, employed by the court services as a coordinator based in Lincoln County. Missy Johnson is employed as a coordinator in the county. Judge has stated to other people in the courthouse that she does not believe anything Missy Johnson says. This is just, it's just like on and on and on. Judge further testified at the council that she has made unkind comments about Ms. Johnson to her bailiff, Angela Miller, and she has concerns about Ms. Johnson's credibility. She thinks everybody's lying to her. If everyone else is the problem, maybe everyone else isn't the problem. <sighs> judge sought advice from other judges in the courthouse on how to get Missy Johnson removed from her courthouse because she wants her gone. Again, not your job. On August 22nd, respondent screamed and pointed her finger at Missy Johnson in front of her supervisor, Tiffany Karam, because Johnson assisted the court clerk in entering a court minute order at Judge Mueller's request for a case assigned to Judge Mueller. Judge Mueller revoked the defendant's pretrial release bond because the defendant violated terms of pretrial release. Subsequent to defendant being remanded back to custody, judge contacted the court clerk demanding to know who authorized the revocation. It's not your case. This is the judge that she uh, threatened. It's not okay to scream at people. Johnson took her supervisor with her to respondent's chambers where respondent screamed and pointed her finger at her. Missy explained that Judge Mueller ordered the revocation and she had a text message from the judge indicating the same. The judge calmed down, but said something to the effect of, it's not that I don't trust you, but you must come and see me to get warrants signed or issued. It's not your case though. What, you think you outranked the other judge? Why? 
on February 21st. Case was set before judge for plea agreement on a motion to revoke for violation of a victim's protective order. Violation of protective orders are serious business. I, I, hate, I hate to keep reading. Judge contacted defense counsel asking that he and the DA appear prior to the plea hearing to discuss with her the issues in the case. Okay, fine. Something's going to go wrong or it wouldn't be in here. At the meeting, judge told the attorneys she could not accept the plea because she reviewed the underlying VPO and did not believe it was still in effect, even though it had been ordered to remain in effect in a companion domestic matter. So the judge lied to the attorneys or the judge is incompetent? Is the judge a liar or is the judge incompetent in this? When asked about whether she was advocating for one side or engaging in an independent investigation when she obtained information about the VPO, she testified that she could not rely on the defense counsel to have researched that on behalf of their client because the defense counsel was Zach Privet, who judge explained to the counsel she believes is incompetent. Ma'am, you can't be on the bench doing counsel's job. You don't get to do the defense counsel's job. You don't get to do the prosecutor's job. You need to the fuck do your job. I think this defense attorney's incompetent. Ma'am, if you think everyone else is incompetent, the counsel would like to remind you that it's not them. Emily, can you make this document available to us? Yes, it is publicly available. I can just give you the link to the case. Oklahoma State Courts Network, this is the case. I'm going to give it to Megalina, and we can put it in the description and put it in the chat. But yes, this is the public docket for the matter. So yes, we can. Emily, keep reading. Damn it! When asked if she just did not trust that his defense counsel had checked it out, respondent replied that she did not. Judge was asked if, when the judge made a comment like that, could the defense attorney ever appear before her since she questioned his abilities? And it could be perceived that she was trying to help the defendant because she did not think his counsel was competent. Judge said that that was not her primary thought. It should be. Her primary thought was whether she was going to find the defendant guilty knowingly um, if there was a factual basis for that. Judge testified she was concerned about what the defense had done. His competent, yes, I guess, yes. That was some of the conversation. When asked if she would agree to some extent that she was trying to make up for some of his defects, she said, yes, not your job, ma'am. Not your job. During the state versus Martzall trial, respondent mocked the state in a text message to her bailiff, stating they are not used to going up against competent attorneys. When asked who the attorneys were appearing opposite the state who were not competent, judge replied, Oh my God, you guys, there are a number of attorneys that appear in my courtroom that are not to the level that I practiced at, not as prepared as I was when I go to trial and not having exhibits and those type of things. My personal opinion is they're sloppy or they're lazy. As an example, our OIDS attorney very rarely, if ever, files any kind of motion on any issue. And one attorney in particular who I have great fondness for that is very rarely prepared, Zach Privet. I mean, have you guys ever seen Zach in court? Mess. Like, your honors, you kind of just needed to be there. Like, you don't understand what I'm dealing with. Like, I'm up here. Okay, and these attorneys are, like, down here. Like, we're not on the same level. And that's really hard for me, your honors. Like, you're not seeing how hard this is for me. Like, I have to be in court with these attorneys being boring, being unprepared, being disrespectful. 
Like they ask me to do things that I just don't want to do. They're not doing their job the way I thought that they should. Like this is not what I signed up for. I wanted a bigger paycheck and I like don't want to get pulled over anymore for speeding. That's why I'm a judge. Not to put up with like this. Like, ew, your honor. Ew. Sorry. Um, it was it was it was giving uh junior high. My bad. So when this judge is called out on their behavior, what they did was try to explain their behavior and be like, but you don't understand, see, because they they are bad and I'm better. Respondents' derogatory statements about and conduct towards the Lincoln County District Attorney's Office or the Lincoln County District Attorney and his staff have risen to a level such that her impartiality would reasonably be questioned in any case in which they appeared before her. Were they papering her? Her conduct in this regard to include telling multiple courthouse staff that the ADAs have lied to her on multiple occasions and thereafter threatening to file bar complaints against them based on ex-party communications she received joking about the size of an attorney's penis during trial. Wait, attorney's penises. Your honors, it's obvious it's like this big. I mean, he's got baby hands, so maybe it fits, but obviously this attorney is not rocking a package. Maybe that's what he's trying to make up for in court, but <laughs> he's like, ew. Joking about the size of attorney's penises during trial, implying that the state lied about missing evidence and calling them a variety of names constituting not only violations of rules 1.2, 2.3, 2.8, and the code of judicial conduct, but also constituting gross partiality as the term is used in Article 7A, Section 1B of the Oklahoma Constitution. Ma'am. No. Likewise, respondents' derogatory statements about an Oklahoma court service coordinator, Missy Johnson, that she is a liar and wants her gone, and that the Lincoln County OIDS attorney, Charles Thompson, and the defense attorney, Zach Privet, are incompetent, are statements of gross partiality. It's all gross. Oh, more gross partiality and oppression. There's more. There's more. How the fuck is there more? This should have been an entire episode. I was not prepared. I was not prepared. Chad, I was not prepared for this. On January 24th, defense attorney Adam Banner appeared before respondent for the district court arraignment in State versus Roberts. Roberts was charged with the with murder and his trial was set for June 5th. At the arraignment, judge advised Banner, attorney, she was going to continue the trial till October because there was another in-custody murder case first for June 5th. At his client's insistence, attorney advised judge that his client wanted to be second up in the remaining uh, and remain on the June 5th jury term. Respondent rolled her eyes at him and changed her tone and demeanor with him thereafter. Oh my God, like you've been charged with murder. Like don't try to tell me how to run my courtroom. Like I understand that you want your trial to happen in like a speedy trial way as like, I don't know, guaranteed by the constitution and whatever, but like, how dare you? How dare, how dare you? How dare you ask for your trial to go forth quickly? Rude. Okay, so rolled her eyes and changed her tone and demeanor with the defendant for X, for, for, asserting his constitutional rights. The chat is now realizing that this judge has only been on the bench for six months. How does this, how does all of this happen in six months? On March 24th, 2023, that defense attorney banner appeared before judge for motion hearings in State versus Roberts, same case, Roberts was charged with first degree murder for the shooting death of a rival motorcycle club member. Ma'am, ma'am, don't fuck with the MC defendants. What are you doing? A variety of motions were docketed to be heard that day, including the defendant's stand your ground motion, so self-defense, 
Defendant's motion for bond states notice of intent to use gang evidence and defendant's objection there too, the outcome of which would determine whether the motorcycle group, the MC, was referenced as a gang during the trial. The defendant's wife testified during, they said wife, not old lady. I'm offended. Sorry. Motorcycle clubs. Y'all know what I'm talking about. The defendant's wife testified during the hearing on the stand your ground motion and was apparently blinking a lot. Being in court is really fucking stressful. So I imagine it's more so if your spouse is on trial or going to be on trial for first degree murder. Your Honor, did you not watch Sons of Anarchy? What is happening? You could, you know, if you're going to objectify folks, maybe just watch Sons of Anarchy and just like leave it to the TV. During the testimony, Judge made eye contact with her bailiff and began blinking fast at her, mocking the witness that was sitting between them. Between them. She was mocking the witness in front of the witness while the witness was on the witness stand. Your Honor, this is this is not judicial behavior, ma'am. You are a nasty junior high school student wielding power over others. I, our profession weeps for you. I, I might be more mad at this judge than I am at Girardi. I have to, I have to, I have to contemplate who I'm more mad at because Girardi was stealing from the most vulnerable, but this judge is putting her whole fucking foot on the scales of justice. How does this keep going? My brain hurts. Okay. During the testimony, respondent made eye contact with her bailiff and began blinking fast at her, mocking the witness that was sitting between them. I bet the attorney saw it and that's how they know this. Later in the hearing, when addressing the motion for bond, judge stated to the defendant, I don't know that I can place you in the custody of your wife quite simply because I find some of her testimony to be incredible. Not credible. Following the hearing, judge laughed to another courthouse staff member about having caught her bailiff's attention during the hearing to blink at her and explain that the witness probably starts blinking when she's lying. Approximately two and a half months later, how is this still going? During the Martzall trial, that's the one we talked about in the media articles, judge and bailiff exchanged text messages about whether the mother, co-defendant, was blinking as much as the wife in the Roberts trial. Following redirect of the defendant's wife, judge inquired of the witness herself. Don't do that. Judge asked 17 questions, which concluded with her asking the state to hold up a piece of paper with a number drawn on it for the witness to read the number from the stand. At issue was whether the witness could clearly see the information about which she testified. Ma'am, not your job. Many of defendants, friends, family, and supporters were present in the courtroom that day. Following counsel's arguments on the bond motion and a discussion of the conditions of the defendant's bond, judge stated. But he's also in a biker gang that apparently likes to do some really ridiculous things that grownups shouldn't really be doing. Oh my God. So that's a strike against him, but he's a member of a gang that's a negative. That's a negative. I find the notion of motorcycle gangs and danger to the community in this kind of day and age to be ludicrous. And I'm talking to anyone in the audience that may be in one of those gangs. Be adults. This is ridiculous. Who in here is a member of the outlaw motorcycle gang? I have a very good memory. And if you come to court to testify and testimony comes out that you are a member of the outlaw motorcycle gang or the pagan motorcycle gang, and you have sat in my courtroom and didn't raise your hand, we're going to have a big problem. I'm remembering your faces. And I didn't even exaggerate any of that. That's what the fuck she said on the record. On the record, 
Also, people have a right against self-incrimination, ma'am. Excuse me, can you please just tell me which one of you are gang members while you're sitting here in court? Also, why are there two different motorcycle clubs? I wonder if this was a shooting between motorcycle clubs. Um, and that's why there's members of two different motorcycle clubs in the courtroom at the same time. Um, it's rich, Your Honor, that you're telling them to be adults. Ma'am, you're texting your bailiff about the size of the DA's dick. Come now. Telling people to be adults. In her May 19th written response to the Judicial Council investigating her, Judge argued that she did not call any individual ridiculous or ludicrous. She said, this is ridiculous. I find the notion to be ludicrous. Oh my God, Your Honors, you had to be there. Like, who's even in a motorcycle gang anyway? Ugh. Ludicrous. The hearing on the state's motion, the hearing on the state's notice to introduce gang evidence and the defendant's objection was continued to April 10th. She hadn't even determined whether the gang was a gang yet. Space Cat asked, how did she get hired? Oh, Space Cat, she was elected. Because I don't think anyone expected this. Later the same day, the judge published on Facebook to a group called Girl Attorney, okay? Sidebar. Judges shouldn't be posting about their cases on social media at all. It goes against the canons of judicial ethics. But either way, here we go with what the judge posted to Facebook in the Girl Attorney OK Facebook group later. Note to future self. Calling motorcycle gangs stupid and juvenile to a room full of gang members may get you on a hit list. <laughs> And later she responded to her own post, one of these days I'll learn to be judicial. Oh my God, you guys, I'm so edgy. Like I mocked a bunch of gang members in front of them. Uh. Stop it. The defense attorney was made aware of the Facebook post by both the prosecutors for the DA's office and two female attorneys or interns from their law firm, at least one of which was also a member of the girl attorney. Oak. Oh, they mean okay like Oklahoma, not okay like, okay. My, my, ba my bad. <laughs> that makes more sense now. It appeared to the defense attorney that despite not yet holding the hearing on whether the motorcycle organization or club could be termed a gang and whether his client could be referred to as a gang member, given that she referred to the group as gang in her post, that she had already made up her mind. Uh, yeah. Moreover, it appeared to the defense attorney based on the statement that the judge believed that his client and associates would kill another human being without legal justification. Yeah, the judge isn't judging. She's like, oh, <laughs> they're gonna green light me. Cute. On Monday, March 27th, Defense attorney contacted the judge's chambers to schedule an in-camera meeting to request that the judge disqualify from the case pursuant to the rules. Excuse me, Your Honor, you're clearly biased in this case. Yeet thyself. Judge was out of the office and bailiff demanded to know why the defense attorney would be seeking the judge's disqualification before agreeing to call her to schedule a date for an in-camera request. After speaking with the judge, the bailiff called the defense attorney and said, Judge wants names. She wants to know where you got that information from. Was it Rachel? It was Rachel, wasn't it? Referring to assistant district attorney Rachel Thompson. It was Rachel, wasn't it? Tell me it was fucking Rachel. God. Fuck you, Rachel. The defense attorney confirmed that Rachel was the person that provided the information to him, but not the only person. And the bailiff said, She wants all the names. All of them. Also, the defense attorneys 
have a right to know this information. The judge shouldn't be posting this on social media. And good for the DAs for letting the defense attorneys know that the judge was exhibiting bias, a bias that favored their position. The only appropriate thing for the DAs to do is be like, I need you to know that this happened. I am aware of it. Good on the DAs. Good for you, Rachel. Woohoo! After disc, the judge wants to put out a hit list at this point, it seems. She's absolutely creating a burn book. She needs all the names. This girl is the nastiest, fugliest. Shit, I don't remember the rest of it. You guys can help me in the chat. Okay, so she's absolutely building a burn list, a burn book. She needs names. It's full, full mean girl vibes. You're a judge, like literally be above it. Maybe some th fucking therapy. After disconnecting the call with the defense attorney to call the judge back with the names, the bailiff called the defense attorney a second time to inform him that the in-camera would be taken up April 10th at 9 a.m. and he should bring a written motion on the Rule 15 request and that all previous orders in the case were stayed. The defense attorney clarified that under Rule 15, future proceedings are stayed, to which the bailiff replied, no, all of her orders, including the bond, are stayed. Oh, fuck. You can't punish the defendant because of your own behavior. The defense attorney concluded that the judge had predetermined she would not grant the in-camera request based on her statement to the bailiff that he should bring a written motion. Yeah, that doesn't that doesn't take forward-looking. It doesn't take a a swath of tarot cards to to derive that this is what the judge is going to do. Shortly after the defendant, sorry, the defense attorney contacted the judge's chambers and she learned her post on the girl attorney OK Facebook group had been shared with him. She published a subsequent post. Fucking hell. Removing herself from the group. I'm leaving. OK, that's not in the motion. The judge was removing herself from the group because, quote, someone Rachel, shared one of my posts outside this group. Apparently, this is not a safe place for a judge to be human. I'm leaving this Facebook group. I need to announce my departure. All of you need to kiss my ass and grovel that you are so sorry and that none of you would ever do this because I did not expect this from you. I am a judge. How dare you, Rachel? Oh my God, you, you're a judge. Prior to the in-camera request on April 10th, defense attorney advised the DA that he thought it was important to get the in-camera proceeding on the record. When the bailiff let the defense attorney and DA know that the judge was ready for them, defense attorney said to the bailiff, okay, we want the court reporter. Oh, no. DA said to the bailiff, okay, we want the court reporter. Bailiff went to talk to the judge and then told them. A judge will not allow a court reporter in her chambers. The attorneys both said, we want a court reporter. And then the attorneys could hear a loud bellow from chambers. No. Ma'am, they don't trust you. Just do it on the record then. This is not a weird thing. Judges have judges have in chambers hearings with court reporters literally all the time. This is not weird. After the attorneys entered chambers, judge advised that she previously called a judge who told her she's not required to put this on the record. The defense attorney said, you might not be required to put it on the record, but when we request that it goes on the record, that means you're required to put it on the record. After she again refused, defense attorney told judge he wanted to go into the courtroom and make a record about the judge not allowing him to make a record. Fine, Your Honor. I need a record made that you refuse to make a record. That's how we're going to do this. Good for the defense attorney standing up for his client. Respondent rolled her eyes and says, are you serious? 
When he affirms, she rolls her eyes again and says, okay, go in my courtroom. Ugh. Like, why? What does it matter to her if it's on the record? In her written response dated May 19th, judge acknowledges that both parties were requesting a court reporter in chambers. And both parties requested to make a record in the courtroom about the judge not allowing them a record. Witness testimony and transcripts make clear that both parties requested a court reporter and the judge is aware that they were requesting one. During her testimony before the council on judicial complaints on July 24th, judge asked if she believed only one party was requesting a court reporter or both, and she answered as follows. So on May 19th, she said she knew both their... I feel I can see the trap being sprung. On May 19th, in her written request, she said, both parties were asking for a reporter. During her testimony on July 24th, she says this. One, at the time, I originally said no. Miss Thompson was standing at my door, not like at my door, but at the bailiffs, like in the hallway. She's not yelling at me angrily, but she's away from me. She's like, we want a record. And I'm like, you want a record? No, not in my, not, in, not in my chambers. Like not in my chambers. Like out of my chambers. No. Question. So you sought advice from other judges before you were aware that both sides, because at one point you did become aware that both sides wanted a court reporter. Isn't that accurate? Am I remembering that correctly? Not until I went into, like, not until I went into the courtroom and made the record of me not allowing the record. Lies. Can I just scream liar in Khloe Kardashian's voice? I need a sound drop. Liar! Can I just, like, scream liar, liar? When the parties moved into the courtroom to make a record about the respondent not allowing a record and again that both sides requested a court reporter, judge said she would not allow a court reporter for the in-camera request unless and until either side could give her statutory authority requiring her to do so. She then gaveled out and slammed the door to her chambers. I've actually seen a judge storm off the bench and slam their door like a child. It's a very unnerving thing. You're like, oh, you need to like take a deep breath or something. During the 15 minute break, both parties found Title 20, Section 106.4. I love that they're just working together. Of the Oklahoma statute, which requires a court reporter transcribe a judicial proceeding upon request by any party. Show me the law. Fine. Here. Ugh. Gross. Thereafter, but without any conversation with counsel, the bailiff entered the courtroom and advised that the judge decided to allow them to have a record. Like, it's not like the law requires me to, okay? I just changed my mind, like, independently. What? I'm allowed to change my mind. Ew. In written response to counsel, judge stated that she inquired of Judge Balkman if she was required to allow the attorneys to have a court reporter during the in-chambers hearing. He advised no. He would do it on the record and keep it short. And then under oath at a hearing before the Council on Judicial Complaints on July 24th, Judge again testified that Judge Balkman told her that's not how that worked and that's not allowed. Judge Balkman would like to have a conversation with you, ma'am. Judge Balkman disagreed. Judge Balkman admits that respondent contacted him about the issue, but denies giving that advice and further testified he would not give that advice because he does not believe it's in accordance with the law. So she has thrown her bailiff under the bench, under the bench. Yes, under the bench. She has thrown her bailiff under the bench. She has thrown other judges under the bench. She has threatened another judge. She threatened an entire motorcycle gang and told them to act like adults. She uh, mocked and maligned witnesses attorneys took the weird pictures is now becoming one of the least weird things in all of this, which is really fucking weird. <sighs> judge also inquired of judge Kirk, how to handle the request to make a record of the in-camera proceeding. It's literally not that hard. Excuse me, court reporter. 
can you just come have a seat? We're going to, we're going to just have it in chambers chit chat. And I need it to be on the record. That's literally how that works. Sorry. You're right. Two motorcycle gangs. Judge Kirk, uh, let's see. A respondent inquired of Judge Kirk. Judge Kirk advised to allow the court reporter and be consistent between the in-camera and the courtroom requests. Before hearing the in-camera request, respondent judge told Judge Kirk she was going to deny the request. Nah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Law, whatever. Nah. Judge was provided a copy of the criminal bench book at the 2022 Judicial College. Section 37.1 of the bench book provides a checklist for many issues related to court reporters and specifically recites, oh, they've just laid it out for her, specifically re recites 20 OS 106.4, which provides that refusal of court to permit or to require statements to be taken down and transcribed by a court reporter is a denial of due process. In response to defense attorney's arguments regarding judges perceived and actual displays of bias, judge argued, I'm human. I, excuse me, counsel, I'm human. I'm entitled to have an opinion of the things that go on in the world. <laughs> Every judge on the bench is entitled to an opinion about the things that go on in the world. It's like my opinion. Okay. So there's a judicial code of ethics, right? And so even though you might have an opinion, you can't deny people due process is the thing. Judge then went on to deny the in-camera request because she did not believe the statements she made on Facebook met the standard set forth in the rule. Of course, she didn't. The, the rule regarding impartiality? You're not impartial when you've already determined that the motorcycle club is, in fact, a gang under the law, and you've mocked about the fact that they're going to put you on a hit list. It's not going to work. The motion was denied. Shocking. Judge testified to the inquiry counsel that she recognized her statements on Facebook about motorcycle gangs and hit lists were inappropriate before the in-camera hearing, yet still made the parties go through the hearing and refused to disqualify. The fuck? Specifically, she testified, quote, I, I agree today, and I agreed on March 27th when Mr. Roberts' attorney, Mr. Banner, called my office to say he was requesting that I recused. Yes, it's like today I agree it's an inappropriate statement. And I agreed back then too. I didn't recuse at that point of time because I felt again in court and Mr. Banner had stated to me all times I was appropriate to him and his client and I don't feel like I was biased against like Mr. Roberts, you know? Judge, judge, you just had to be there. Like, I knew I shouldn't have done that, but like, it's not really a big deal. So what else? Like, you just had to be there. Defense attorney, this defense attorney must have been losing their mind. Defense attorney specifically addressed both actual bias and the appearance of bias with judge during his request. On appeal and without a hearing, Judge Turner, the presiding judge, um, issued an order disqualifying the judge. They appealed it. They appealed it. Good for you. I mean, kudos to defense counsel. Defense counsel was like, this is seven types of fucked. So we're going to just take it up on appeal. And the appellate court, the administrative district, looked at that and went, oh, fuck. Goodbye. This has all happened within six months. In her written response to the inquiry counsel, judge responded. Judge Turner advised me he was granting the motion to recuse because I discussed a case pending before me, not because I had shown bias towards the defendant. Judge, what's the big deal? Like, I was talking about ongoing cases. I'm not like biased against like gangsters or whatever. 
The judge recounted that he did not state he found no bias, and it's the appearance, not real bias, that counts. Judge Turner's like, the fuck I did? How is this still happening? How is this still happening? In two other pending cases, on May 30th, counsel for defendants in State versus Batty and State versus Allen approached judge in camera seeking her recusal on these cases as both involved defendants who associate with motorcycle clubs or gangs and the defendants, I mean defense attorneys, but defendants, felt that respondents' comments on Girl Attorney OK Facebook group did not give the appearance of a fair and impartial judge in cases involving motorcycle clubs. Yep. On July 24th, before the inquiry council, the judge said the parties had not yet made an in-camera request and the parties don't really know all the specifics. Your honors, like you just had to be there. I, I just, can't I be human on Facebook? Like, why? She said, quote, when they came in at this point in time, I wasn't, like, I wasn't, I didn't know anything about their case, right? I didn't know that it involved motorcycle gangs or clubs, whatever. I didn't know anything about the case because it had been up on immunity. I hadn't reviewed it, which is what I told them. I don't know anything about your case. I don't know anything about your, like, what they're charged with, what the facts of the case are, or anything about that. So let's hold the phone She says, hold the phone. This transcript is her saying, hold the phone to the Judicial Review Council. This is her retelling what she's saying to the attorneys. The lack of self-awareness is spectacular. So let's like hold the phone. What I'm going to ask you to do, because I know you're not going to be on this jury term, let's put a pin in this and come back so in the event that you need to go forward with like additional steps we have plenty of time because i know i'm not going to be able to get you a hearing on a request right now because like i've dealt with these other cases that are set for this jury term that i need to get dealt with like it just it doesn't work for my schedule right now and we were just there for a status i set another date and i said that you know Talk to Judge Turner, review the transcripts, because both of them came in and said, we really don't know all of the things. We don't have a motion filed or anything. We just like heard about what you said on Facebook. And so I said, well, let's put a pin in this. Like, I'm not biased. I'm just a human on Facebook. We can take this up at another date when I know I'm going to have time. And so we haven't yet had the in-camera request other than the very, very quick, like, judge, we don't really know all the specifics. We're going to ask you to recuse. Um, but we haven't gone through that process yet. So, your honors, uh, you just needed to, like, be there. It's not really a problem. It's a problem if you're forced recused from a case involving motorcycle clubs, you can't be on the other cases. Oh my God, they're still talking about Facebook. However, four other people in the room recounted that the details of the defendant's association in the motorcycle clubs was explained to her and they're concerned that the Facebook post presented an issue with respect to her ability to be fair and impartial in their case. Excuse me, we told you? All four further recounted that respondent denied the request to recuse during an in-camera request because she stated she did not know their clients had made any specific comments about those clients, so there was nothing to suggest she could not be fair. How many times has she lied to the inquiry panel? Are we counting? I didn't know I needed to be counting. Lies to the inquiry panel. This needed its own episode. But here we are. <laughs> Too deeply invested to go anywhere else. Sorry, mods. I didn't realize we'd been streaming for four hours and 20 minutes. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Here we are. Respondent's denial of the request is further evidenced by the defendant's filing motions to recuse on July 13th and July 14th. After conferencing with Judge Turner at the Judicial Conference in mid-July, Judge filed a recusal in both cases. 
Yeah, I imagine, this is my imagination, that Judge Turner was like, what the fuck are you doing? Respondent received specific training on social media usage and disqualifications and recusals at the Judicial College in December 2022 prior to taking the bench. You know what they tell the judges at Judge College about social media use? Here's, here's what they tell judges at Judge College. Take notes. Don't. Full stop. Don't. And we're seeing this play out over and over again where judges have social media accounts that come up um, or OnlyFans accounts that come up. And it's like, what are you doing? Does this violate judicial canons of ethics? And there are conversations to be had about judges and their First Amendment rights, but they are part of the judicial branch and the appearance of impropriety is part of the judicial canons. So at Judges College, they generally are told, don't. Prohibited extrajudicial activities. Is this more? There's more extrajudicial activities. Extrajudicial is so hard to say. Since taking the bench on in January 2023, Respondent has published various posts on Facebook in direct contravention of the advice presented to her at the 2022 Judicial College. Yeah, the advice they presented to her is probably don't. I mean, I did not attend the Oklahoma Judicial College. However, it's not surprising how these things work to anyone who's ever met a judge ever. On January 24th, 2023, Respondent published a Facebook, a quote, blooper of the day. Hmm. Defendant on motion to revoke. I tested positive for marijuana, but I have my card. Clueless judge. Is that even allowed? Like, are we allowed to have cards? What are cards? What do they do? Can I smoke? Can we smoke now? Did you bring anything? Are you holding? I've got questions. Do you like gummies? Like what? What kind, what kind of weed are you using? Clueless judge, is that even allowed? DA and defense attorney in unison, no, it's not. My bailiff laughing hysterically. I need to read the marijuana laws. <laughs> you guys, it's such a like quirky Facebook post. Like, look at me being clueless. It's adorable. In a position of authority over people's lives. It's not cute or funny to be incompetent. Only 47 days before publishing this post, respondent had received training at the Judicial College about issues with judges using social media and admonished to refrain from this type of activity. Oh, Emily, keep reading. They actually say that they say don't. On March 7th, respondent published a Facebook that she... Filled in for another judge and did my first domestic docket today. Finally, a subject I completely understand and can't possibly screw up. Not sure if everybody would agree, but I think I passed. The counsel interpreted this to mean that she agreed or believed she had screwed up other cases. Did this judge work in family law before coming to the bench? and then still treated the murder of a toddler with absolutely zero dignity or solemnity? Really? On March 15th, 2023, male attorney Bill McDonnell appeared before judge on a motion for default judgment on behalf of Tinker Federal Credit Union against the unknown successor of a deceased debtor in case. Judge denied the motion on the basis that notice and service by publication was improper without prior approval from the court. The attorney noted that he had been doing this for 41 years and had never done it that way. I kind of hate it when attorneys do that, though. That same day, respondent posted to the Girl Attorney OK Facebook group. <laughs> what not to say to the judge. I've been doing this for 41 years and have never done it that way. Definitely not a good idea, especially when you've been doing it wrong. At least 53 people re reacted to the post, either liking or laughing at it. Female attorney Jane Robinson commented that this was sort of fun watching from the bleachers, to which respondent replied, 
You would have thought he would have taken a hint from the case in front of him. When asked, the male attorney was unaware, respondent judge, was recounting the day's events on Facebook or making fun of his argument on a public forum with female attorneys that other attorneys have been made aware of. I can't even be human on Facebook. You guys keep telling on me. Where am I supposed to make fun of the attorneys? Not on Facebook. And from her, Jesus Christ, it gets worse. And from her official district judge Facebook account, judge republished an advertisement seeking financial sponsors for the sixth annual Chandler Bell Cowboil. What? Chanan Little or Bong. The Chandler Bell Cowboil. And also published a picture and statement seeking financial support for the local Girl Scouts. You can't do that either. Respondents' Facebook posts or reposts soliciting funds for charitable organizations violate rules 3.1 and 3.7 and Canon 3 of the Code of Judicial Conduct. Although involvement in the community is a noble effort, soliciting funds is a particularly problematic endeavor with very strict limitations about which respondent was specifically warned at the 2022 Judicial College. The 2022 Judicial College. She doesn't even go here. Responsibility to decide. Viol We're not done. Violation of rules 1.2 and 2.7. Judge issued a new policy that all felony probable cause affidavits for warrants and arrests must be brought to her. That's not how that works. I... Ma'am, you're, you're not the queen. You don't just get to decree shit. All warrants must be brought to me. No! Respondent told her bailiff to let the district attorney's office know this was the rule. You don't get to just make new rules. You're not the fucking site judge. Oh, the site judge must have loved all of this. There's a boss judge. She's not it. Six months. All, all of the... All of the affidavits for warrants need to come to me. I can't imagine. I can't imagine that she understood search warrants. T told the bailiff to tell the DA's office to, to let them know this was the new rule. And she herself told the associate district judge, Kirk, that all felony probable cause affidavits must be brought to her. Although Judge Canavan in Nope, uh, pot, Potawatomi, Tommy, I know. Sorry, y'all. Uh, in another county, can hear cases in Lincoln County. He is not assigned to the docket in Lincoln. Judge is otherwise the only district judge assigned to hear the felony criminal docket, which will create conflicts if the same judge both issues the probable cause affidavits and hears the proceedings following the preliminary hearing. Yeah. It's why warrant duty rotates, because if you sign the warrant, you can't hear the case. Because if they make motions that the warrant should have been signed, you can't hear them. In late January, the DA's office presented a probable cause affidavit for four felony counts of lewd acts on a child. Judge asked the assistant to discuss the charges with her because she did not believe the charges were pro No. The judge indicated to the DA, this is like the second in charge, first assistant is like the second in charge to the DA. The judge indicated to the DA, calls Nick, that the charges were too harsh because the defendant was a juvenile when the charges were committed and now he's an adult and being charged as an adult. The DA provided case law to the respondent on the issue. You know, they get to make charging decisions you get to make law decisions. You don't get to just make up the rules. Judge discussed the charges with Judge Mueller, who advised her she need only be concerned with whether probable cause exists. Yeah, not your job, ma'am. Because the other issues will be handled at the time of the plea or the preliminary hearing. Uh, ma'am, just do your job. Uh, stay in your lane. Be a judge. Judge indicated to Judge Mueller, Mueller, <clears throat> 
Judge indicated to Mueller she felt the young adult was remorseful and has turned his life around. That's not your decision until sentencing. Judge refused to sign or return the probable cause affidavit to the state for over six months. When the state inquired, she said she was going to confer with other judges about the issues. Not your job. After the summer judicial conference, judge conferred with Judge Brad Benson, who had been assigned to uh, as her mentor at Judicial College. Oh, Judge Benson. Oh, dear. Poor Judge Benson. Respondent conferred with her mentor judge about the issue. Mentor judge gave the same advice as Judge Mueller. Correct. Correct. Only need to be concerned with probable cause. Ma'am, that's not your job to determine. If at sentencing you get to decide if somebody is remorseful, but it's not your job. Respondent signed the charges in late July 2023. There's another charge, charge 10. Misapplication of the Sixth Amendment. Oh, good. More constitutional violations. <sighs> like your whole job is to like uphold the Constitution. So misapplication of Sixth Amendment is, um, yeah, it's going to be a problem. On January 10th, defendant McCraw appeared before judge on a motion to revoke. This was judge's second day on the bench. The defendant previously appeared before Judge Ashwood, who advised him to complete an OIDS application, uh, which is probably the public defender's application, and return with the completed form at his next sitting. On the issue of hiring an attorney, judge said, It is generally the policy of the court that if you can afford to get out on bond, that you can't afford to hire. And no, it's not. No, no, no. Okay, let me read her quote. It is generally the policy of the court that if you can afford to get out on bond, that you can afford to hire an attorney. And I'm very hesitant to tax the taxpayers of this county in this judicial district with your representation costs because you're out on bond. You have a vehicle that you do not drive because you can only drive one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to order you to sell that vehicle and try to hire an attorney. And I'm going to sit you again on January 24th to reappear. This is the third time you have to reappear with an attorney. Do you understand that? At that time, if you do not have an attorney, then we're going to revoke your bond and put you back in jail so that you can qualify for indigent defense. Do you understand that? No. No, I don't. No, I don't understand that because that's not how the fucking law works. Sell your car to hire an attorney or I'll put you in jail. I'll just, I'll just put you in jail. I'll revoke your bond and put you in jail. Oh God. Why wasn't the defense bar papering her? After this, all of the defense attorneys have been like, we're not appearing before this judge ever. Go sell your car. If you don't hire your own attorney, um, I'm going to put you in jail for not being able to afford an attorney. Good God. The Sixth Amendment right to counsel uh, doesn't say you have to sell your car. See, that's not, that's not how that works. In written response, judge noted that she was advised at the 2022 Judicial College to, quote, be creative when dealing with defendants and their ability to pay for criminal proceedings. I doubt that's what you meant. The reference to be creative at the Judicial College was from Judge Hetherington relative to Rule 8 hearings and the ability to pay for defendants whose fines and fees have been adjudicated, not defendants attempting to exercise their Sixth Amendment right to counsel. Court appointed counsel. Ma'am, that's not what they said. She further suggested that next time she will suggest the defendant sell an asset to hire an attorney, but not order it. Oh, so she's, you've learned nothing. On January 17th, defendant Cullum appeared before judge on felony, disp felony disposition docket. The defendant appeared without an attorney because her lawyer was arrested. 
What? <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand how we're here. The defendant appeared without her attorney because her lawyer was arrested and detained in the Lincoln County Jail. Couldn't you just bring the attorney out from custody? What happened with her attorney? Why is the attorney in jail? Why is the attorney in jail? I mean, at least the attorney is in the same jail. Although her attorney was not scheduled for... I can't... Her attorney was arrested and being held in custody. Although her attorney, Deborah Campbell, was not... Why do... Don't... Deb, I don't know what's going on. Was not scheduled for the docket that day. Respondent had her brought from the jail to the full courtroom for the docket on which her client was appearing. She ordered the attorney out of custody to a full courtroom after satisfying her concern of whether the attorney maintained any client funds that could be returned to the defendant, judge stated to defendant, you are out on bond, and so you do not qualify for an indigent defense attorney at this point in time. If you wish to qualify for indigent defense, show back up on January 31st at 9.30, and you'll be placed back in custody where you qualify for indigent defense. Do you understand? So the judge is like, the only way you're getting, the only way you're getting provided court-appointed counsel is if you're in custody. If you are out on bond, you are not getting court-appointed counsel. That's not how that works. The defendant returned on February 21st, again, without an attorney, and respondent stated that it's not her practice to give someone that is out on bond a state appointed attorney. It doesn't matter. That's not what the law says. Judge said, if you are out, you are capable of working and hiring an attorney. Respondent added if she was out on bond, then she was capable of coming up with money to get out of jail. That's not necessarily the case. On January 17th, the defendant appeared before respondent or defendant Plagonia appeared before respondent and was in custody, but also without an attorney because he was previously represented by attorney Deborah Campbell, the one who's in custody. Judge reappointed the OIDS attorney who was present in the courtroom and then stated to the defendant, sir, if you are out on bond, you are ordered back here on January 1st at 9.30 a.m. January 1st through the 31st at 9.30 a.m. Ms. Thompson is appointed as your attorney at this time. If you bond out, you will not qualify for indigent defense. Do you understand that? So she is telling people that they are required to stay in custody in contradiction of the law. Recognizing this was judge's first month on the bench, the Council on Judicial Complaints sought a response from respondent about what it perceived to be violations of the defendant's Sixth Amendment rights. When, um, and the Oklahoma statute, when the court's determinations appointing OIDS relied solely on whether the defendant was in custody or not. The council appreciated, sorry, the council anticipated respondent would recognize the explicit requirements of making determinations on applications for court appointed counsel based on the citations provided by the council. They tried on this one. More specifically, 22 uh, Oklahoma statute 1355D and case law are clear that posting bond cannot be the sole factor in making this determination. Instead, judge, through her own counsel, responded. Your honors, the practice of not appointing court-appointed counsel to a litigant out on bond is not uncommon in many counties and courtrooms in the state. Respondents' actions are no different than many other judges in this state. Excuse me, judge, you had to be there. Like, they're doing it too. It's fine. No. During the criminal bench book presentation at the 2022 Judicial College, Judge Edwards and Judge Lewis discussed the difficulties in getting defendants to hire counsel and move cases forward. But Judge Edwards made clear, obviously, if they think they qualified, certainly there are instances when out-of-custody defendants qualify for OIDS and those should be properly considered. There's more. 
independent investigations of facts and ex-party communications. I can't believe there's more. On February 8th, respondent presided over her first criminal judicial trial. On February 8th, a month after being on the bench, judge presided over her first criminal jury trial in State versus Gordon, which included two felony charges for lewd acts with a child and one felony charge of enabling child abuse. Following the state's presentation of witnesses, the defendant entered a blind plea. After the court accepted the plea, the defendant was escorted back to the county jail and her court-appointed counsel left the courtroom. So she took a plea without a deal, took a plea not knowing what was going to be sentenced, saw the um, presentation of evidence, the state rested, and they were like, I'm, play I'm just playing guilty. Like, we don't need to do this anymore. But without a promise of what the sentence would be. Without opposing count, oh God. Without a potusing counselor, the defendant present, the state and respondent continued to converse with the jury. Judge explained to the jury that the defendant entered a blind plea and what that means. After asking the jury whether they had any question, the judge inquired, quote, obviously we didn't hear the defense side of it, but show of hands, who was leaning towards guilty? That contravenes literally everything. This is this is my husband. Hey, I'm still streaming. Um, I'm still streaming. I'll be done in like a few minutes. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Sorry, y'all. Cause my husband's like, why are you still streaming? Um you can't ask the jury to determine guilt without hearing both sides of the case. <sighs> Show of hands. You guys all thought he was like, you thought she was guilty, right? Like, come on. Gross. After one juror did not raise his hand. Oh God. The judge said, Mr. Coulson, you didn't raise your hand. After which the bailiff chimes in. I told you. Oh my God. He was the one I was concerned about. Oh my God. The, the judge went on to advise the jurors, so I will tell you there is a videotape. <gasps> no. So I will tell you there is a videotape where she made statements consistent with the testimony of the daughter, to which a juror responds, that's what I was waiting on. If the jury didn't know that there was a videotape at the end of the state's evidence, they might not have ever seen that. What is happening? Following the ex, the improper ex party communication with the jury prior to sentencing, the judge told Judge Mueller it was not a good idea for the defendant to blind plea to her because she was going to throw the book at her. I'll look at everything, but it's not going to go well. It's not going to go well for her, obviously. <sighs> at sentencing, is how does this keep getting worse? On April 11th, Judge told the defendant that exercising her constitutional right to trial was an enhancing factor in the judge's determination when sentencing her. You, you can't hold people asserting their constitutional rights against them. We started the jury trial back in February and completed a day of testimony and a couple of witnesses. And then on the second day, you decided to enter a blind plea. And you have pled guilty to the charges of lewd acts to a child under 12 years of age, two counts, and enabling child sex abuse, and uh, as stated in the amended information filed February 26th, you required a preliminary hearing where you required your daughter to testify in open court in both your presence and that of uh, John Bonner, her other perpetrator. You required a jury trial, which then required your daughter, your daughter, to testify in open court in your presence again and in the presence of 12 strangers and multiple individuals in the courtroom. And then after her testimony for the second time, you decided to enter a plea of guilty. You had the right to a preliminary hearing. You had the right to a jury trial. You also had an obligation to protect your child. I mean, before all the abuse, maybe. Uh, you required those two hearings knowing that you had already confessed to the allegations not once but twice. Respondent sentenced the defendants to 30 years on two counts of lewd acts with a child and 40 years on one count of enabling child abuse 
uh, with the third to run consecutive. After learning the court communicated with the jurors following the plea, the defendant's attorney filed a motion to withdraw the guilty plea and the motion was denied. That's going to go up on appeal, I'm sure. Respondents in person testimony. Judge appeared at a hearing before the council on July 21st. Within the first six minutes of testimony, respondent used the F word three times. Your Honor, you had to be there. Like, what the fuck? It's fine. In all three instances, Judge was recounting a factual event or her strong feelings when she learned that the Council on Judicial Complaints had subpoenaed her personal cell phone. Excuse me, Council, we have your cell phone. Judge, fuck. I mean, it's a well-placed fuck. It's correct. Because you're fucked. During her testimony to the council, respondent exhibited a pattern of offering misleading or false statements. Following are the names and addresses of, no, we're not going with that. It's probably business addresses, which is fine, but still. Um, immediate temporary suspension. Petitioner of the Judicial Council alleges that the circumstances giving rise to the foregoing facts against respondent are in grave danger of continuing. There is no evidence the respondent will voluntarily cease and desist in the performance of these matters, which give rise to the filing of the petition. There is an existing emergency justifying the trial division of the court on the judiciary of the state of Oklahoma in temporary suspending respondent from office pending the determinations of proceedings. Great and irreparable harm and injury will occur if the judge is allowed to continue in the capacity of judge. The petitioner requests that the presiding judge of the court on the issue order the respondent to appear at a date, time, and place certain for an order to show cause why they should not be suspended from the exercise of, you know, judging. Relief requested, yeet immediately. And that is the end. Yeet immediately is the only thing the only thing that has to happen here. Yeet immediately has to happen. Has to happen. Chat, we have a lot of super chats. I have not been able to get to all of them. And Dr. B is calling because there is something I need to do at the house. I am sorry that we're not going to get to all of them. Most of them are just lovely, lovely high hellos. So thank you for that. I We have gone so long today that I'm not going to get to Q&A. What I will say, oh, this is so sweet, Michelle, $17 for 17 years, wishing many more to come. I came <laughs> for the initial Tati case, but stayed because of you. Here's my favorite purple-haired, cursy, Jersey Shore-loving badass. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Rosebud, between watching accused, guilty, or innocent on a and &E, I understand so much more of the legal court rulings due to watching your channel. I'm glad. I am going to let you guys know that next week is going to get crazy as I'm traveling. Please make sure you download the Lawnard app at lawnardapp.com so that you can stay in the loop with all of it. Um, new podcast will be on Wednesday. I will have a stream on Tuesday. I will, um, I will not be streaming. Well, I'll stream a little bit on Thursday because of hearings. So with all of that, um, we are going to have to say goodbye. Diana G, I've been in the picky with my baby because of SRV for a week. Listening to you help us a lot mentally. Keep your amazing work. You're welcome. P.S. Introduce you to my husband while in labor, and he's a lawn or two. Yay! Take care. Those are scary times. You you are going to you are going to get through it. I promise. Um, Aurelia said time served. I don't think she was paying attention. This judge is a, is an absolute mess. An absolute mess. Thank you for everyone who gifted memberships. I see tons of them in the chat from Jay Michael and April Warren and, and so many others. Thank you all for the gifted memberships. Thank you, Law Nerds, for being amazing. Sorry for the extra long stream to the mods. Thank you to the mods for being incredible. Y'all, this is wild. This is the rest of the document. I did it. This was the whole thing. We did the whole document. We skipped over names and addresses of witnesses, but that was the entire thing. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye. Lawnards, I appreciate you. I will see you in the next one. You can stay up to date with everything I'm covering and fast notifications on our free iOS and Android app at lawnardapp.com or search the app store for Lawnard. You can also follow me around social media and don't forget to check out my podcast, The Emily Show, 
with quick bits dropping every Monday, summarizing everything I do here on the live streams on Tuesday and Thursday for when you just have time for the quick bits. Thanks for being a law nerd.